also um, you know, a great friend of mine, and uh, I'm very indebted to him also coming back. Um, but um, you know, we'll we'll have a great uh, talk, and uh, I'll do a formal introduction in a second. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we are seven. So we'll we'll start off with our live program because we are on time now. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me share the. Um, do you want me to share the uh, introductory slide? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Good uh, evening, everyone. Um, welcome back to the third iteration uh, of this uh, super specialty course um, that has been put on between the NSI and the CNS. Um, controversies in neurovascular surgery. Um, we've been really lucky to keep coming back to um, our friends here and, and being invited back. And I think the first two uh, times have been a great success. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm pleased to um, you know, host this again with uh, my great friend, uh, uh, Professor Manas Pagrahi. Um, and this time we're gonna have uh, Dr. Mark Bain uh, from the Cleveland Clinic as one of our panelists um, uh, from the US, as well as Dr. Brian Jankovitz um, as the panelist um, from uh, Cooper University uh, in New Jersey. Um, and the topic uh, this time is uh, vascular lesions. Um, and uh, Professor Bain is gonna talk about minimally invasive resection of intracranial vascular lesions. Uh, but we're going to have a whole gamut of uh, topics ranging from cavernous angiomas um, to tumors. Um, and uh, I think this is going to be a nice rounded uh, way of talking about some of these challenging lesions that uh, do have blood vessels and therefore are vascular. Um, so happy to be here and um, let's uh, move on uh, and uh, uh, forward with this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clemens. And, uh... I, I thank uh, my CNS counterparts, Dr. Clemens, Dr. Bain, and Dr. Jankovic to, to participate in the meeting today. And uh, uh, this is the third in the series, and we have a fourth uh, meeting on uh, spinal vascular malformation in December, on December 9th. And uh, I hope all of you will participate in that. I'd like to thank all uh, my speakers, Professor uh, Gupta from PGI Chandigarh, and Professor uh, Dwarknath Cinemas from uh, Nimans, Bangalore, and Professor Suresh Nair, uh, was ex HOD, head of the department and uh, dean of uh, Sri Chitra Institute, and who will be speaking on ca uh, cavernomas, angiomas, cavernoma, and multiple hemangioblastomas. Uh, because many times you have patients who come uh, with multiple lesions, with uh, like multiple hemangioblastomas or multiple cavernomas, with one symptomatic lesion. And we treat that symptomatic one, but we have we are uh, uh, confused with what to do with the leftover ones. Uh, with the advent of radio surgery, uh, patients keep on asking whether uh, one should observe or or go for radio surgery for the reasons which are seen, which are asymptomatic. But today we are going to discuss on how to manage the reasons which are as asymptomatic uh, and that keeps bothering uh, psychologically the patients as well as. Uh, uh, the, doc, the treating neurosurgeons also. And we have in the panelist, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Chandrasekhar Dev Pujari and Professor from uh, Bombay Hospital. He is the uh, ex-president of uh, ISPN, as well as the currently he's the chairman of uh, endoscopic so, uh, committee in WFNS also. And we have Professor Siddharth Ghosh uh, from Chennai, Apollo, head of the department there. And both of them will present cases and initiate discussion uh, uh, on on these controversial lesions, and we have uh, Professor uh, Jankovic from uh, Cooper Hospital, uh, Cooper US, and he'll also present the case. Uh, with these few words, I, I request uh, Professor uh, Sunil Gupta, head of the Department of Neurosurgery at uh, the uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Science, uh, uh, Chandigarh, to present on his topic on surgery for cavernous angioma. I request Professor Gupta to share his screen. Uh, 
Dr. Gupta, can you please share your screen? Hello. Yeah. We cannot. Um, okay. Yeah. We can see. We can see your screen now. I'm not sure we can hear you. <clears throat> can I start? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. I have prepared it more as a CME lecture because uh, I think uh, many residents will also be joining. So I have prepared it more as a sort of a uh, continuing medical education and uh, I'll review the literature and presenting the later on a little bit of our experience. So cavernous and humors, uh, the incidence varies from 0.2 to 4% and there can be incident, it can be sporadic or, or it can be part of a familiar thing. And many genes are implicated and 10 to 30% can have development of venous anomalies. So they can present as a symptomatic hemorrhage or a focal neurological deficit. They can be a symptomatic hemorrhage also. If you see, if you technically, if you look at the images, practically all cavernous nomas radiologically show some evidence of bleed. But we are talking about cavernous and geomas who are symptomatic for hemorrhage in the form of acute presentation or a seizure or a focal neurological deficit, which needs treatment. So incidental ones may not need treatment. So if you uh, have a look at the statistics, incidental detected cavernous and geomas can bleed at the rate of 0.33% annually. If there is a focal neurological deficit not related to hemorrhage, uh, this is coming in my view, this, uh, okay, I will accept this. Can it? Okay, now it's okay. Annual risk is around 2.18%. And if present, someone is presented with hemorrhage, then the annual risk is 6.19%. So this is important to, because our treatment, whether surgery or radio surgery, has to improve on the natural history. So it's necessary to know what is the risk when you detect an internal syndrome. It is not a uniform risk for all patients. For example, if you see this slide, in patients who do not have a hemorrhage, who do not have a focal neurological deficit, and who do not have a brainstem lesion, the risk is 3.8% over a five-year period. If you do not have a focal hemorrhage, you do not have a focal neurological deficit, but the lesion is present in the brainstem, then the five-year estimated risk of bleed is 8%. Similarly, if the lesion is a brainstem and are presented with hemorrhage or a focal neurological deficit, the risk becomes 30.8%. So this natural history and location and presentation is important to determine your modality of treatment. I will not talk about this because uh, this is going to be talked about by, um, I think this has some overlap with my, my presentation, Dr. Dwarka, so I will skip this thing. Surgery is a well-defined benefit of surgery are there because there is a low rate of morbidity and mortality and a good rate of seizure control. But in an undone CCM, surgery is not warranted because the complication of surgery exceeds the risk in a patient who has a cavernoma which has not bled or which does not have a focal neurological deficit. Even in eloquent locations, if you use the right technique and surgical trajectory, you can achieve good results. Of course, morbidity, depending on the location, whether it's thalamic or brainstem, can range from 5 to 18 percent and sometimes as high as 50 percent. There's a very nice article from uh, Chang et al., which explores the various surgical techniques which can be used to surgically excise these lesions, even if they're situated in the supratentorial eloquent areas like thalamus. For example, this is a beautiful slide. This is a motor strip area, this is the visual cortex, the brocas are uh, the speech, uh, this is the, the opercular area, thalamic region, corpus callosal region, and visual stat cortex. So you can use a carefully planned trajectory with a transcircal approach or a pre-motor transcortical approach to access a lesion and which can be removed with, without major morbidity or mortality. So even in so-called eloquent areas, if you use a proper trajectory and plan you carefully, you can achieve a good result. It can be a transcortical or transcalcal. Similarly, lesions in the corpus callosum can be 
approach the anterior interferometric approach or a posterior interferometric approach depending on the location and which can lead to a good result similarly basal ganglia lesions if they are projecting into the ventricle you can go transclosal and uh, remove that or there are other windows available so what i am trying to say is you, we cannot should not label all lesions in the eloquent areas as not surgical with a carefully planned trajectory you can access these lesions depending on your location and plan your trajectory and approach carefully along with neuro navigation to achieve good results which can improve on the natural history and with minimal morbidity morbidity so this was the article i'm talking about so they had 79 patients with gross total resection 97% and 96 patients were 98% patients improved 96% of patients were seizure free so this was mainly by planning your surgical trajectory carefully similarly some authors have used for especially for brain stem lesions these uh, dti although the results of dti have to be carefully studied which can improve or reduce the morbidity and mortality in patients if you use this additional technique now again in eloquent areas especially in the motor strip awake anatomies along with cortical and subcortical mapping and with neuro navigation can achieve good results so what i would trying to emphasize is in supratentorial areas which are eloquent so called eloquent areas you can achieve good results with proper planning and trajectory this uh, is coming in my view this uh, screen can i minimize it because i am seeing all the okay uh, similarly there are uh, studies from pediatric patients also showing good results with surgical techniques now seizures patients who present with seizures and who are not bled can be managed conservatively but there are many series which have shown that even in seizures if you have a early surgery you can have a better overall outcome especially you you need not wait for the seizure to become refractory or have a long term side effects of anticonvulsants so surgery can be offered even early in patients who present with seizures so there are many series supporting this thing and when you do surgery to you have to remove most of the authors believe that you have to remove the hemosiderin rim because that can lead to better reduction in seizure frequency if you remove the hemosiderin hemosiderin rib so there are many studies showing good good outcome with surgical treatment of supratendinous cerebral cavernous angiomas as compared to conservative treatment and the better outcome is better if you operate early so there is a class 3 in cavernous angioma there is no class one evidence for anything but there is a class 3 evidence that initial surgical treatment can have better seizure control over 5 year period in deep seated cavernous angiomas surgery carries a risk of significant deficit especially in brain stem and other eloquent areas also in one series the focal neurological deficit was seen in 34% of patients which persisted in 9% another article the good results with no deficit was achieved in 70 all patients who were non brain stem lesion but only in 75% with brain stem lesions so that for surgery patients who present with symptomatic hemorrhage or a focal neurological deficit surgery is the gold standard especially in non eloquent area for refractory seizures surgery gives good results and also consider surgery early surgery to achieve a better quality of life oxygen or hemosiderin ring gives better seizure control carefully planning surgical trajectory use the neuro navigation intraoperative monitoring awake anatomy is necessary to minimize mor morbidity in patients who have a lesion in the eloquent area this is the take home of the synopsis of surgery for this lesion the disadvantage of surgery is many series if you see in deep seated lesion brain stem or other areas or the thalamus the deficits which are achieved are seen in many series are not acceptable For the same in two thousand one, forty-seven percent Barrow's group, almost one third of the patients had significant permanent deficits. So then, that's why the role of radio surgery is explored for patients, 
of cavernous angiomas. In nutshell, radio surgery may be considered in solitary CCMs, cerebral convexity and um, cavernous malformations, with previous symptomatic hemorrhage if it lies in an eloquent area that carries an unacceptable surgical risk. So, surgery and radio surgery are not competing with each other, each has its own indication. In an eloquent area with an unacceptable surgical risk, radio surgery may be considered. It is not recommended for symptomatic CCMs or that are surgically accessible, nor in familial CCM because of concern with de novo CCM. De novo CCMs are more commonly seen if there is associated deep venous anomaly, uh, developmental venous anomaly. The people, proponents of radio surgery also advocate radio surgery for seizure control also, although this is controversial. So if you look at this slide, this is all in favor of radio surgery, but there are many articles which doubt that radio surgery is really effective for the CCMs. So this is a major article because we have to understand the basic biology of cavernous angioma is different from AVM. AVM, you, you have a radiological endpoint. You can demonstrate that the AVM disappears after a few years after giving gamma knife for pseudotic radio surgery. You cannot do that in CCM. It is only clinical thing. And for example, Lawton has said that in 2011, they said there's no biological basis of GKRS for CCMs and they do not offer it. Even after CCM uh, obliteration, CCMs can have residual activity. And I will come to one more thing. The animal, so if you see the older series, the radio surgery results were not satisfactory and they were explained in, by in recent years because of poor imaging, poor targeting, including now inclusion of DBS, and high dose is given. You look at these uh, combined meta-analysis. This shows that before SRS, the before SRS, the annual hemorrhage rate is 34 percent. After SSR, SRS, within two years, for up to two years, it reduced to 9.7 percent, and after two years, it became 0.56 percent. Now this comes with a caveat. Your the entire premise of saying that SRS improves results after in cavernous and Yomas is how you interpret the annual bleeding rate prior to SRS. And you see different articles, the annual bleeding rate before giving SRS has ranged from 2 to 34%. So if you have a 2%, you can say there's no difference. If you say 34%, there's a remarkable difference. So why this discrepancy? It all depends on what you consider when the cavernomas, if you consider that cavernomas are present from birth, then you have an annual incidence ranging from five, where did this go? Well, yeah, you see, you see this, if you use this method, that the cavernous and is present since birth, then you have an annual incidence rate of 5%, 6.5%, 4%, 4%. If you consider from the time of presentation, the annual incidence rate is 17, 34, 36. So there's a market difference upon in this, how do you calculate this? And that will determine whether your SRS results are good or better or worse. If you consider this, the second method B, then you'll always say that your SRS results are better. If you consider like this, the presence is worse, your results will be almost similar. This is important. So goal of treatment GKRS is reduce the risk of bleeding, decrease the chance of seizures and have a low risk of treatment related side effects. So some articles have shown, they may, I'll just quote, go to them. The, there's a reduction of, say this, this article has considered the pre gamma knife risk to be 23%. And post gamma knife, within two years, the risk came back down to nine and three two point two percent in different groups, then reduced further to 7.5 and further one. The risk reduction is noted within first two years also. Similarly, Many articles question this thing because there's a so-called clustering of thing. After a single bleed, most of the bleedings which occur, occur within the period span of two to three years. And after two, three years, the bleeding risk all automatically reduces even naturally. So whether the result of SRS is because of a natural clustering and natural history or because of SRS is difficult to prove. And the risk with the SRS are re-hemorrhage, radiation side effects, and de novo development of a new lesion. So there are various, depending on which article you want to, uh, so this one says 
the post GKRS the reduction is from 34% to 12.3% and then 0.76%. Another article with the GKRS dose of 11 to 12, 18 gray. Now this this one has this article has calculated pGKRs annual hemorrhage rate to 3% as compared to 24% 34% different articles. And the risk of ICH reduced after three years to 0.16%. So, so there is there is significant radiation side effect also. In this article, there were 7.2% radiation side effects. So many articles showing reduction in GKR seizure rate also. So articles showing even in first two years, there's a reduction in the hemorrhage rate and two years after also. Now this, uh, in, uh, in a systemic review on this article, this article has shown a different result. It says there's a risk after SRS appears similar to untreated CCMs. And another study after SRS for CCM, the annual incidence of death, ICH or focal neurological deficit is less than 5% and seen comparable to outcome with SRS. So one gets confused if you read uh, different papers. For brainstem cavernomas, most of the recommendations are to treat after the second bleed. But in the recent years, there were many studies which has shown that if you treat after first bleed, overall morbidity is much less because after the second bleed, the risk of bleeding is much higher. So there are many studies and many authors groups who are offering management, either GKRS or surgery, even after the first bleed. The benefits of early treatment appear to be confirmed by the study and repeated measures can carry significant risk of significant higher cumulative morbidity than a with RSS. There are some studies which are educating SRS for seizure control also, although this remains controversial. So in our, in my institute, we are using a gamma knife for SRS. If there are two or more clinical distinct hemorrhages, Typical MRI images, we are excluding true AVM or DVA. In the presence of multiple CMs, only the symptomatic hemorrhage is being treated. And the estimated surgical risk of surgical, and when we think that surgical resection risk is unacceptable. So in our short series of 33 patients, over a period of uh, maybe 10 years, there were 33 patients with single intercranial CM, which were treated with a single session gamma knife. Initially, the dose was between 12 to 18 grade 50%, but at present, it's only 12 to 14 grade 50% isodose. 67% of patients had two more than two years follow-up, and post-GKRS annual bleed is 3.282%. 82% achieved reasonable seizure control. 12.41% of patients had temporary radiation-induced changes, and 2% of permanent deficit. And these temporary radiation-induced changes were managed successfully with steroids. So it, adverse re, re, uh, events following SRS, in the initial years, they, they were as high as 27%, but with a reduction of the dose and with exclusion of the hemosidinidine, that is the inner margin of hemosidinidine is the outer margin, the overall reduction, there will be overall improvement or reduction in the SRS complication, com, uh, complication rate. So the, we should we should use 12 to 13 grade 50 percent isodose. Do not touch the DVA and keep yourself in the resistance of hemostasis. So this I think as as per literature, there is a level two evidence that SRS significantly reduces the rebleed rate, especially after two years. SRS is not considered an alternative surgical resection, but for symptomatic CCMs as an alternative conservative management, which are surgically inaccessible, and we have to always keep in mind that patients who do not have, have not bled, there's a 0.6% annual risk of bleed. Who have bled, bled once, there's a 4.5% risk. And who have bled twice, there's a 30% risk. If you, there's a angioma alliance, uh, which has given different recommendations. Surgery, surgical resection is not recommended for asymptomatic uh, cavernous angiomas, especially if located in eloquent areas. It can be resected in a solitary asymptomatic lesion if it is accessible in non eloquent areas and, and sometimes in asymptomatic if it because of psychological burden. Early surgical resection causing epilepsy should be considered. Surgery may be considered in symptomatically easily. I will uh, come to this later again. 
indications for resection of brain stem cavernous angiomas after single bleeding or spinal is, is weak but after two bleedings you have to offer serial surgery radio surgery may be considered in solitary cavernous ca cavernous angioma lesions with previous symptomatic hemorrhage in eloquent areas they carry an unacceptably high surgical risk it is not recommended for asymptomatic cavernous angiomas or which are surgically accessible or in familial disease some examples for example this patient presented with medial temporal with a bleed there were no deficits but this is so obvious it suggests it can be easily assessed so this patient was operated by transferring resection with evacuation of the total excision and evacuation of hematoma again cavernous angioma of the optic chiasma with a bleed with visual deficits transylvanian gross total excision along with hematoma this patient has not presented with the bleed but with cold focal deficit so at at present it is under he has under observation but one can consider srs this becomes a little controversial whether to keep under observation or give srs up front now this patient has presented with a focal neurological deficit underwent cross approach and gross total excision post op ct again this there is no doubt about this patient he can be your need surgery transcortical gross total resection one but has to choose your trajectory carefully so that you don't have a surgically related deficit so you choose a transcortical or navigation guided approach so that your deficit is minimized similarly this patient with a ponto mesencephalic cavernoma this has a surfacing on the pia here so this this gives us a window to subtemporal route and you can enter into the cavernoma and excise it completely similarly multiple angiomas you treat only the symptomatic one and by carefully chosen trajectory to minimize the deficit you take it out this of course uh, you can operate or this patient with a pineal region cavernoma this is again a medullary cavernoma this patient these were treated with uh, gamma knife and follow up 7 years no rebleed or seizures again deep frontal uh, posterior frontal cavernoma near the motor area underwent gamma knife with 14 gray this the patient developed post radiation edema but responded to steroids so you have one you if you draw an algorithm you have to see whether the patient has bled once or more than two times if there is a patient has bled once then depending on the location critical not then offer surgery or observation but if patient has bled two or more times with a 20 to 30 annual risk then it has to be offered either surgery or radio surgery depending on the location so to summarize if there is a incidental or asymptomatic lesion observation is the best policy do not touch this patient if patient present with a hemorrhage or a focal neurological deficit in a non eloquent area surgery is the treatment of choice if patient has seizures which are well controlled observation is a good is a uh, good line of uh, management but early surgery sometimes have benefit in these patients also if there are seizures which are refractory or drug related problems in non eloquent area surgery is the best option if patient has a hemorrhage and focal neurological deficit but in eloquent area then we have to consider carefully whether this lesion is presenting into the ventricle that is it has a contact with the appendema or pia if there is a contact with the appendema or pia then we can use this window to along with neuro navigation monitoring and awake anatomy to, to surgically excise and give a good result with minimal morbidity in in cases where we think the surgical risk of morbidity mortality is not acceptable then we have to consider cystic radio surgery and in lesions in brain stem one has to think that should we wait for a second bleed or offer management either surgery or srs even after the first bleed i have tried to summarize the literature available and our results thank you thank you professor gupta for uh, I mean summarizing the salient points of how to make a decision in uh, managing uh, uh, cavernomas um we'll have a, a case pre- case presentation by the panelist and then they will ask to you to comment depending on your uh, literature review what will be the best way to manage uh, so um, 
uh, we'll have the discussions later during the panel discussion i request uh, dr clemens to introduce dr ben for the next lecture yeah thank you and uh yeah great uh, overview professor gupta and i have so many questions um you know now i'm like confused what to do with my patients um but without uh you know further ado um you know uh, i'm pleased to introduce uh professor mark bain uh from the cleveland clinic uh mark is a great friend of mine um we've known each other for several years and uh i asked him to talk about hemorrhagic uh or vascular lesions um so he uh turned us around a little bit uh and he will talk about the minimally invasive resection aspect of intracranial vascular lesions and uh, given that he sees a lot of uh, great pathology in his uh, location at the Cleveland Clinic, I'm really looking forward to this talk. So without further ado, uh, Mark, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Great. Right, thanks, Clemens. I'll just share my screen. Clemens, you see that okay? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. Well, Clemens, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody on the panel and the organizers for inviting me to speak. It's a, it's a true honor. Um, and thanks, Dr. Gupta, for that, for that great talk. So um, I, today I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in Cleveland uh, and I, I was uh, for vascular lesions. And I was trying to think of some a little bit of a controversial topic, as this is the title for this session. Uh, hopefully, I don't do too much controversial uh, surgery here, but I was hoping to uh, um, talk a little bit about what we're sort of pushing the envelope on with uh, with vascular and neurosurgery. So, a lot of this is a little bit more about the approaches that we're using uh, for common vascular lesions. Uh, and I'd be curious uh, as uh, on the panelists' thoughts. Um, sometimes when I present this, it does get some questions uh, and brings up some controversial. Um, uh, comments. So uh, without further ado, these are my disclosures, uh, nothing that really pertains. Um, so I, I think, you know, why minimal access vascular neurosurgery um, or minimally invasive vascular neurosurgery? I guess I, I really don't like the term minimally invasive. Uh, anytime I think we're doing vascular neurosurgery, it's, it's highly invasive. So I think that probably the proper term is more minimal access. Um, and, you know, classically, you know, uh, minimal access approaches in vascular neurosurgery are really not considered, uh, I think, for the fear of bleeding, uh, for the fear of the lesions. Um, people just like to make big incisions and big craniotomies. Um, obviously, that has a lot of downsides, uh, a lot of, has, a lot of uh, you know, disfiguring uh, cosmesis for the patient, uh, you know, keeps the, hosp uh, the patient in the hospital for quite a long period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, length of stay uh, really suffers for these patients and also just patient satisfaction. They want minimal, minimal incisions, uh, minimal scars. Um, I think the endovascular revolution, I am an endovascularist. I, I, I do a lot of endovascular neurosurgery as well. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we have, uh, you know, devices like the web device and radial access approaches now and things that we're doing, you know, patients, uh, I, I think, are just less tolerant to large incisions uh, and large craniotomies uh, than, they, than they once were. Uh, I know as I'm getting more mature, uh, not that mature yet, but as I'm getting more mature in my practice, um, you know, I'm moving towards really thinking about uh, making smaller incisions. And Clemens, I've heard you talk on this topic uh, for your MCA aneurysm surgeries. There's even a push for, you know, even same day uh, or next day discharges for routine MCA aneurysm surgery with very small incisions with blocks and things of this nature. So I think endovascular pressure has pushed us a little bit to look at more minimal access approaches as long as they're safe. Um, here in Cleveland, here in the U.S., there's quite a bit of administrative pressure as well. You know, if my patients are staying in the hospital for weeks and weeks after, um, uh, you know, routine, uh, let's say, small AVM surgery or things of that nature, uh, there's pressure from our administrators to get patients out of the hospital and patient cost. Um, uh, also, patient experience. You know, uh, patients talk and, you know, we have to have a good patient experience. And some of what I found, even in competition in some of these, uh, you know, high competition areas in, in the larger cities, patients talk about their incisions. They talk about, um, you know, the, the, the approach that was done. Uh, and it's a, it's a good way to market your practice if you can have some minimal uh, access techniques. So um, the story for us in Cleveland, 
um, uh, we were just sort of looking uh, for different approaches to common vascular lesions. And I'm not saying that this fits every vascular lesion, certainly, you know, aneurysms and giant AVMs, you're not going to be looking at minimal access approaches, but there are, I think, some very good indications uh, for minimal access approaches. We're looking for better, better patient outcomes. Uh, you know, is there a way, uh, and like Dr. Gupta's presentation with cavernous malformations, is there a safer way to surgically access these lesions uh, through transulcal approaches with tubular retractors and things of that nature, so you have better patient outcomes? Uh, always looking at increased patient satisfaction, like I said before. And one of the things we're looking at and studying is can we decrease our patient's length of stay in the hospital? Uh, is that a possibility? And are we able to get these patients out sooner if they have blocks and they have uh, less pain postoperatively? So um, our story in Cleveland, this is, this is what we're using. Um, uh, this is the brain path uh, tubular retractor system from uh, a company called Nico. Um, I got involved with this device. Uh, initially, I think people were using this a lot for tumor uh, resection and minimally access tumor surgery. Um, and we got into uh, this looking at um, resection, or minimal access resection of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So I had a lot of experience using this device for intracerebral hemorrhage. And uh, because of that, we started uh, in our comfort using this device, uh, we started moving into more complicated lesions with vascular, uh, you know, pedicles and with, with, and with a lot of vascular um, uh, surrounding uh, tissue. So uh, the way that our approach with this, uh, th this, this retractor system works in, th in this approach is we do use a small craniotomy. Uh, so we're doing craniotomies that are only about a centimeter or two big. Um, very, very small incisions. A lot of times, depending on the location, it'll be a small forehead incision, only a few centimeters big. Um, uh, and this is a minimal access port. We're using this in a transulcal way, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, in order to try to displace fiber tracks uh, ra uh, rather than destroy them, rather than going perpendicular to them. Um, uh, we uh, occasionally are using uh, DTI imaging with our stereotactic placement of this device. Um, so we can you know, really look at the best approach, uh, sometimes functional MRI as well. Um, and then once the tube is in place, uh, this blue obturator is removed um, and you can use an exoscope or a microscope, um, uh, whatever your preference is. Uh, the thing I like about this the most, the most and the, as you get more comfortable with the technique, I'll show you some slides in a second, um, you can use electrocautery, which obviously you need if you're going to be doing vascular lesions. And you can use bimanual dexterity. So you can use your normal suction and bipolar down the small tube to really be able to use bimanual technique to be able to suction, clear blood, and to coagulate. So um, you can really do a normal surgery. It's just the approach that's a little bit different. So these are other pictures of this device. Um, and there's different diameters. Uh, this blue tube over on the left-hand side of your screen, this is about 13.5 millimeters in diameter. Um, the green tube is 11 millimeters in diameter. And I found that the 13.5 is probably the best for vascular lesions because it's a little bit easier to get two instruments down. Uh, the 11 millimeter tube, uh, I think is really good for biopsies and maybe some uh, deeper intracranial hemorrhage and things like that. It's, it's sort of at the limit, I think, with 11 millimeters of what you can do bimanually. Uh, your instruments tend to sort of hit each other, um, and interfere with each other while you're using the 11 millimeter, but it is, uh, it is smaller. Um, and, you know, potentially for some maybe non-vascular lesions, it, it does have some uh, benefit. Um, in this view, you can see sort of your working angle. Um, so there's not a lot of room in this tube, uh, but you can, uh, you know, get instruments down. This is this Myriad device, which is sort of a, a sucker chopper device. We use for intracranial hemorrhage, but um, uh, you can, uh, you know, get instruments down this in a bimanual fashion and look sort of coaxially down this, down this tube. Um, this is the, the picture I like the best over on the left here. So you can see that you can get a bipolar cautery down here and you can get either a suction or, or a myriad device or some other device that you have that, that, that you may want to suck with. Um, you just have, it's just a little bit challenging once you get down the tube to really work around each other. So it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of a learning curve uh, to figure that out. But you can, you can coagulate and you can do normal surgery through these tubes. Um, this is how the system works. You basically put a stereotactic wand, for that. those of you that don't know, down this, and you can place this right to the lesion. This blue obturator removes. We do open the pia uh, over the sulcus to place this, and then it sort of just displaces the tissue. Um, these are the different length tubes that you can pick. Um, and uh, this is just sort of a, a picture of how we do this through you know, a transulcal approach and you know, very, very small craniotomy, almost, almost the size of a burr hole, a little bit bigger that you can access these lesions in. 
Um, this is sort of our, our typical setup. So uh, this is actually placing the tube. So we do, uh, this was an earlier case. I was doing a little bit larger craniotomy at that point, just so you can wand the tube up and down and side to side. Gives you a little more uh, flexibility, but now we're even to the point where we're making very, very small, uh, just, again, like I said, just a little bit bigger than burr holes. Uh, small skin incision. Uh, so only a couple centimeters big on the skin incision. Uh, and then I think another big benefit of this, if you look, we don't open the dura, we just open it a little bit where, I fully open the dura, I should say, uh, we just open the dura a little bit where the tube goes. And I think that's nice because it sort of protects the surrounding brain so that the brain doesn't herniate out and, th and things of that nature. So pretty small, uh, minimal access um, uh, opening here. And this is kind of how we do this in a transulcal fashion. So we do open, uh, open the pia around um, the sulcus and we do try to use a sulcus to go down and if you think about it, if you have a lesion deep, let's say a hemorrhage or something of that nature, you're really only traversing some of the U fibers at the bottom of the sulcus. Uh, this device does a very good job of pushing veins and arteries out of the way. Um, and it really does not disturb uh, those vascular structures. So you can feel confident to go down a sulcus to get to the lesion. Um, and then once you're in position, there's various instruments you can use to, to remove the lesion. This is just a hemorrhage case, but um, I'll, I'll show you instruments uh, where we use instruments and, and bipolar cautery down that. And I, th I do think there's some benefit to this. Um, you know, people sort of criticize this approach and saying, well, I can just do this with, you know, with a sucker uh, and a bipolar and having an assistant kind of hold open the brain. Um, I do think there's some benefit to a, to a tubular retraction system. So it sort of disperses the force uh, around uh, that retractor um, and it's sort of a static force as opposed to some, you know, kind of pulling the brain apart with, you know, with, with, uh, with brain ribbons or, you know, with having somebody kind of hold that open for you or using a sucker and a bipolar, you know, you always start with a small, uh, you know, opening and then it tends to be bigger at the end. So I do think there is some, potentially some benefit, um, uh, you know, just having a more tubular retractor type uh, MIS port uh, to work through. So I want to talk about our, our, our lesions here, uh, and then hopefully we can have some time to discuss these. So um, in our experience, um, uh, we've done, uh, to this point, three uh, smaller AVMs. Uh, the AVMs were all ruptured AVMs um, that we removed through this fashion. Um, so I'll show those cases. Um, cavernous malformations, I think, are just a, a beautiful case for this. Um, uh, you know, it, it, they, the approach is easy to them, and you can really work nicely down the tube to remove cavernous malformations, even very large cavernous malformations. I'll show a case of that. Um, we've removed some mycotic aneurysms. We see a fair amount of mycotic aneurysms from endocarditis at the Cleveland Clinic because of our large heart uh, surgery practice um, and cardiac surgery practice. So um, we've removed some mycotic aneurysms. Uh, so I'll go through some of these cases and, uh, and we can discuss. So this is the first uh, case I'll, I'll, I'll play this, this movie's playing now, but this is a, a young gentleman that presented with a hemorrhage um, and uh, the workup, uh, this is the hemorrhage here. You can see sort of a, a mesial right frontal hemorrhage that extended into the, uh, into the ventricle. Um, Mito, this is a young gentleman, so we thought that there would be an AVM at the base of this. Um, so he went uh, and got angiography um, and the angiogram, which you'll see in a second here, shows this it's very small, sort of wispier AVM fed by ACA branches that drains through these intraventricular veins into the ventricle. Um, now, there's no question you could remove this through an open craniotomy um, uh, if you wanted, uh, or you know a lot of people would delay their care uh, and wait and let the hemorrhage resolve and do surgery later. Uh, one of the things I really liked with this is that um, we could potentially put this tube down, remove the hemorrhage so that the mass effect is gone remove the AVM and then potentially get this patient out of the hospital within a, within a matter of days. Um, so this is the first case that we did. Uh, I actually made a little bit larger of an incision on this just in case I got into trouble. I was a little bit nervous about approaching this through a tube. Um, uh, here's our stereotactic uh, navigation, just navigating away from the AVM into the hemorrhage. And the way this works is you put the tube down and then um, the reason I like a hemorrhage AVM, a ruptured AVM as opposed to an unruptured AVM is you can remove some hemorrhage first to give you a cavity to work through. So here's the tube. You can see this using a sucker and a, and a, and your, and a, and a sort of a skinny bipolar that you can get down. And uh, the first part of this procedure is to remove the hemorrhage uh, very gently so you don't disturb the AVM. Uh, and the AVM uh, is going to be basically sitting sort of over here. This is the caudate here. So basically you remove the AVM to create, or sorry, remove the hemorrhage to create uh, a channel. And then the feeders from the ACA are gonna be coming around here and here. There's the ventricular opening right there. And so the vein is gonna be over here. 
And so just by kind of, you know, you can see that you can operate down this by manually. Uh, the brain is being nicely protected around it. Uh, you know, the, the more superficial, and you can see as we kind of go here, you'll see some very small, there's a wispy feeder from the ACA right there uh, that we're coagulating. You can bring scissors down and, and, and basically do your normal, do your normal surgery. The, the thing that um, gets a little bit challenging is occasionally you'll get frustrated because your instruments will kind of be, you know, on top of each other. And you have to get that sort of sense of how to move the instruments around uh, each other. But uh, same as, as normal surgery now, you know, you go around, you remove the, the feeders, you, you sort of starting to see that we're getting this AVM sort of uh, mobilized here. Um, and in a bit, what you'll be able to start seeing is the, the draining vein come into view. We're taking some more superior feeders. You can see the little little wispy feeder there that we're cutting. And then as we go and open up the ventricle, right here will be the vein. And I can maybe fast forward just a touch here. So we can, there, there's the draining vein right here. You can see it's still arterialized. Sorry, my sucker's in the way there. And the way we're visualizing this is through, through the microscope. So we just have our Zeiss microscope. There's the draining vein. You can see very clearly there. So now we're just getting this around the pedicle like you do for normal AVM surgery. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, and you can see that that vein is getting a lot bluer or purple as we, as we resect this. And here's the, the main move is just coagulating the draining vein and then you remove, uh, remove the ABM as you normally would. So I think benefits of this is ABMs out. This is, this is uh, two day, uh, I think about two days after the, uh, after the patient presented to the hospital, um, hemorrhage is out. So the mass effect is gone. Uh, and then we just cut this and, and, and remove the ABM. So, um, so I'll fast forward a little bit here this is just the remainder of taking this out. Uh, and there comes the ABM, it's out, everything's good. So this is the tube coming out. And as you, as you come out with the tube, uh, it's important not to let blood sort of run down. Um, and then uh, you can see sort of the brain sort of closing up around there, but you can see in this down the sulcus there, you can see a lot of those vessels are, are, are preserved, small dural opening as well. There's a post-op angiogram that shows that the AVM has been resected. And there's the, there was a previously, and uh, there's a post-op CT here that shows that you get, um, you know, full removal of the hemorrhage. So this this person was discharged from the hospital post-operative day two after this to rehab, um, and a young guy, and he recovered very very quickly. So I think I think there's a lot of benefits to be able to do this. Now certainly you have to have the right AVM, a small AVM with small feeders. I wouldn't do this for some you know massive AVM, obviously. Um, so this is a 28 year old that presented with some IVH, um, uh, a young girl, um, and initially our angiogram was negative. We repeated an angiogram um, and showed this very small sort of you know, posterior choroid plexus uh, AVM fed by PCA branches and the posterior choroidal branches. Um, interestingly, we're doing seven Tesla uh, time of flight MRI. Uh, we have a research scanner here. And these, I just wanted to show these for just for interest sake. These are these are images off of our 7T magnet. Uh, and it's amazing the, the definition you get on this little small AVM. This is just this is just a, a, a you know a time of flight without without GAD. Uh, you can see the AVM very, very clearly here, um, the draining vein going into the ventricle. So I thought this would be another perfect case for this. I'm not gonna go through the whole video of this, but um, you know, there's there's the lateral view, so you can see this little small AVM that bled. Um, and there's our post-op angio after putting the tube down and, and, and the AVM has gone and she was again, discharged on post-operative day two. Um, uh, so, so again, uh, ni nice result and uh, very minimal, minimal incision on this, on this young person. Uh, this is a 12 year old that had seen multiple people, uh, around the country. Uh, um, he had hemorrhaged and then uh, recovered from his hemorrhage. Um, and then was looking for what to do with this small AVM. Again, another, you, you kind of get in the sense here. A lot of these are sort of periventricular choroid plexus AVMs. This was right sort of on the, on the, just the opposite side of the other persons, but sort of a, a posterior atrial AVM in the choroid plexus. Very wispy, you can see just a little bit here, and you can just see a little bit of the venous shunting here. So not much left to this AVM, uh, but certainly still a rupture risk because it was filling. Um, and so this is the MRI after the hemorrhage resolved, but you can see basically this is where the hemorrhage was and probably some of the AVM. You can see the draining vein going here. So that we simply did a transulcal approach to this tube and targeted that and resected the AVM. And here's our post-op angio. And he again went home on post-operative day two as well. So so very quick discharge um, uh, for, for, the, for this young kid. So, so that's our AVM experience. I have talked to others around the country here. Uh, one of my colleagues, Justin Singer up in Grand Rapids, Michigan has done about seven AVMs, just like this, these smaller AVMs. So we're gonna be putting our series together and presenting this at the AANS uh, meeting uh, coming up. So, um, so be interested to hear comments on these. Um, this is an interesting case. This is a, we, again, like I said, we see a ton of endocarditis here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we get referrals from all over the, all over the region. Um, 
and do a lot of angiography. So we tend to see a lot of uh, mycotic aneurysm. So this is a 32 year old that had multifocal hemorrhages, this little frontal hemorrhage here, and then I had a hemorrhage in the back as well. Um, did an angiogram and we saw this little, little mycotic aneurysm that had caused this bleed. Um, initially, because the aneurysm was so small, um, he wasn't the healthiest individual as well from a cardiac standpoint. I just decided to try antibiotics, uh, you know, uh, and to see if that would shrink the shrink the aneurysm, despite the fact that it was ruptured. Um, uh, so there may be some controversy there on how people would have managed that. But I just tried antibiotics, and four weeks later, we did another angiogram, and the, and the aneurysm was still there. Um, and, and so, you know, based on the failure of, uh, of um, antibiotics, I decided to just resect this little thing. It's just a little small over the frontal branch. It would just be a simple resection. Um, and, uh, you know, we could, again, we could have done a big, bigger craniotomy and gone down there, but we, we found, we could see this on CTA. So we docked our tube right at the mycotic aneurysm and then just was able to see the mycotic. We just simply resected the mycotic aneurysm with, with the tube. This is our, this, you're going to see this, this, this is off our angiogram, but very small incision, just a blur hole and a little smaller craniotomy. Again, I'm trying to get smaller and smaller with these craniotomies and mycotic aneurysm has gone. The, the procedure took about 30 minutes to do. So, um, so kind of an interesting case. And we're looking at do more and more of the mycotic aneurysms this way. Um, uh, this kind of relates to Dr. Gupta's talk. There's our cavernous malformation. This, this patient had a growing cavernous malformation. He was 46 years old. I'd followed him for years based on the location. This is the location of this. I know a lot of people would say, oh, I, I could do, you know, a transinsular approach to this, transsylvian, um, and get into this. And, and yeah, that, that for sure, I could have done that. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think a sort of a lower frontal approach to this, um, we sort of use a little bit of an, you know, just a little bit of a forehead to, through a crease, small craniotomy, you can dock the tube and get a full resection. Here's the, this is two years post-op. Uh, you can still see the tract here. And I think if you look at this resection cavity, um, there is a little bit of, I, I, he had a little bit of a perforator stroke above the cavernous malformation. And it's one thing I learned in these anterior approaches, you have to be very careful. A lot of the cavernous malformations will sort of stretch the lenticular striates around the front of them. And I think I probably took one of those during surgery, but he recovered fully at a little paresis postoperatively, but did well. And, and this is a, a you know, gross total resection of this and, and it, it's, it's held up. Um, again, he was discharged very, very soon out of the hospital, just again, with a little small incision. So very minimal pain. Uh, and, and, and a nice cosmetic uh, effect. Um, one of the things in our ICH practice we're trying, we're, we're, we're thinking about and, and talking about vascular lesions are, can we target spot signs uh, in hemorrhages to limit the expansion uh, of a hemorrhage? Um, and initially we were kind of worried about that because you know you're gonna get an active bleeding if you go after a spot sign. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very likely chance that if you don't operate and you see a spot sign, this hemorrhage is going to expand over time. So this is a patient, uh, hypertensive ICH uh, that presented to our facility under six hours with this hemorrhage. Um, the hemorrhage did expand a little bit and then we got a CTA and you can see this sort of this little little small spot sign in the medial aspect of the hemorrhage um, uh, that was there. And you can see it's a little bit larger as you go down further into the temporal lobe. So uh, we did another low anterior approach with our brain path tube and, and we used the CTA to, to, to um, uh, dock our tube right at the spot sign. So we try to put it right on the spot sign. And here's the video, you know, you remove the obturator and right away you sort of see some red blood there. It's not chronic blood. So, you know, you got some active bleeding. So again, you can get your, your sucker and your, and your bipolar down here. I'm using an angled bipolar. And what you'll see in this case is as you remove the hemorrhage here, you'll see right up, see some hemorrhages coming out. And right away, what you'll see is you'll see this active little bleeder as I move the scope here, right here, you'll see this little, there it is. You can see that little artery pumping. It's a little lenticular striate artery that's pumping. And this is the spot sign right here. Um, and you can see as soon as we just unroof that, that, all that bleeding started. And again, it's not a lot of bleeding, it's a small vessel, but you know, left alone it could. So you can actually go down, coagulate that uh, through the tube, um, stop you know, the bleeding and stop the potential for this hemorrhage to uh, enlarge. Uh, you can do some irrigation. You can even put some surge cell down to stop some, uh, any kind of uh, oozing that you may have um, and get hemostasis. You can remove the tube um and case done and this this patient uh there's there's the resection of the hemorrhage um he had a little bit of uh aphasia postoperatively his motor uh, weakness he had some paresis uh, actually resolved i think he just had pressure on the posterior limb of the internal capsule so he got better but i think the biggest thing here is that you know he had a potential we don't know we have to look at this more in a randomized way but this guy had a potential for a large expansion of this uh, hemorrhage because of the spot sign uh, which you know usually is uniformly fatal or bad for 
for the patient and a bad outcome. And we were able to take the hemorrhage out, stop the expansion. Uh, he went to rehab post op day five from this hemorrhage, which is much faster than than our, our normal hypertensive hemorrhages would. So so I think that's a that's an interesting lesion uh, and an interesting lesion to target with these minimally access approaches. And the last case I'll say I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, present here and, and then I'll uh, I'll stop is. Uh, I think vascular tumors uh, are, are a really good option for this approach as well, especially some deeper uh, tumors. And again, you can sort of see the theme here. Uh, it's nice when there's a hemorrhage, uh, not for the patient, but from a surgical standpoint, because you can remove that hemorrhage and it gives you a little bit of a cavity to sort of work around. Um, so this patient we were able to remove, uh, it was a renal cell carcinoma with a lot of, uh, with a lot of vascularity. We actually, I don't have the video for this, but we had to take a lot of feeding vessels off the sort of the orbital frontal branches from the ACA. Um, but this patient was discharged on post-operative day two with this hemorrhage again. So, um, and, and we got a gross total resection on, uh, on, on the lesion as well on pathology. So again, I think you're sort of sort of taking care of two things. You're getting rid of the hemorrhage and the mass effect, and you're also getting rid of the, rid, rid of the vascular lesion. So. Uh, in conclusion, um, you know, I, I think uh, it is our duty to sort of push the limits uh, and, and to look for better uh, results for our patients. Um, we are pushing the limits to try to treat vascular lesions from this minimal access approach. Um, I think we're creating some potential new approaches to common vascular lesions. And I'm really hoping, and we're going to be looking at this, and we're looking at our data on this, uh, and hopefully we have better patient outcomes because of this, less wound infections. Uh, better patient reported outcomes uh, and definitely de decrease length of stay and decrease hospital costs by doing uh, these approaches. So I appreciate your time and look forward to a discussion later. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Dr. Bain, for, uh, uh, for showing the beautiful cases of doing uh, through a small uh, craniotomy and uh, using navigation. Um, there are a few questions for you, but we'll have it after the uh, all the lectures. And uh, um, but uh, but a lot of appreciation for the lectures from the chat box for you. Uh, you can have a look at the chat box. Uh, the third lecture is by Dr. Uh, Dwarakna Srinivas. He's a professor uh, and head of the department at uh, National Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience uh, at uh, Bangalore. And he'll be speaking on, uh, Dr. Gupta gave an overview of uh, uh, cavernomas, uh, but he'll be speaking specifically on the, uh, uh, on the management of uh, brain stem cavernomas. Uh, how do you manage uh, uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic one? Whether, uh, what is the best way to treat? Whether to do radio surgery, observe, or do operate? Uh, I request Dr. Swarakna to, uh, to give his comment, his lecture. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Manas. Am I audible? Yeah, yes. Hello? Can I, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll uh, I thank Professor Gupta for giving an overview on cavernous malformation. So it's made my job a little easier. So uh, what, what do we do for brainstem cavernomas? The brainstem cavernomas are one of those most controversial uh, aspects of neurosurgery in which there is a little doubt on the optimal management. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, give a overview on brainstem cavernomas, just focus on them and then compare and contrast the various methods of treatment. Uh, the first, the facts. First described in 1966, they are well-defined uh, encapsulated lesions. And morphologically, it is important because this will uh, influence the gamma knife outcome. They're thin wall without smooth muscles and dilated capillary spaces, and there's no function in the tissue. The one thing to remember is they're very uncommon and 70% are supratentorial. But among the infratentorial lesions, almost 35% are brainstem lesions. And they're most frequently located in the pons followed by the midbrain. Uh, they are usually uh, detected commonly by, uh, by uh, incidentally detected on MRI. And uh, Sometimes they are and the rest present with seizures, hemorrhage, or a focal, de focal neurological deficit with or without a bleed. But among the vascular malformations, they are the most commonly detected. So the uh, natural history is actually quite benign. The risk of initial hemorrhage is very low. It is less than 0.1% per patient here. The annual risk varies between 0.7 to 1.1%. But if there is a previous bleed, the uh, incidence increases and the clustering of hemorrhage is very common. 
and usually occurs in the first two years after the bleed. And this is the confounding variable in the uh, natural history. So there was a study uh, published in 2018 in which the hemorrhagic risk factors were mentioned. And the history of previous ictus and the brainstem location are the most uh, uh, contribute to the risk factors. While the possible risk factors could include perilational edema, large size, a DVA, or a hemodynamic change. Pregnancy multiplicity and antiplatelets anti have been controversial, but uh, they do not significantly increase the risk of bleed. Uh, the clinical presentations, like already mentioned, uh, they, they usually are the focal neurological deficits with or without a hemorrhage. But in the brainstem location, it is Im important to realize whether they are intralesional or whether they extravasate onto the surface. So this is a very interesting uh, table. And as you can see, I, I have outlined what is important. The age of diagnosis between an incidental presentation and ICH is almost less by 10 years. And among the presentations, a brainstem location is more likely to present with a bleed. So that almost 62% are likely to present with an ICH. While 65% of low bar hematomas are more likely to be, low bar uh, cavernous uh, cavernomas are likely to be diagnosed as an incident. So, but even then, even when almost 60% are presenting with hemorrhage, 70% go into conservative management. Whether this reflects the actual treatment choice or whether it's a bias, we do not know. But what is important to remember is that the first outcome event during an untreated follow-up, almost 26% have an ICH again. This is versus 12% of those who are presented with an FND. But even among the even among these patients who are presented initially with the bleed, 71 do not have any other event. But again, you, you have to contrast this with the ICH, that only 3% going to uh, have an ICH uh, in an untreated follow-up. Uh, radiology is classical. It's a popcorn-like appearance, so I will not delve too much into that. The, the problem is the, uh, it's a perfect dilemma. So you have three options. Uh, you have surgery, you have gamma knife, and you have observation. And you're always left wondering what the perfect decision is. So uh, if you look at observation, you, you need to first uh, have the risk of ICH in an untreated ICCM to know it. So there were two studies published in 2016, both in neurology and Lancet, in which the fire estimated risk of ICH during untreated follow-up. So if those present, patients who presented without an ICH or an FND, 8% bled again, that was the risk of ICH. But in those patients who presented with an ICH or an FND, 30, almost 31% presented with a re-bleed. So you see those patients who are presented with the ICH or a focal neurological deficits have a very high risk, almost a one third risk of a re-bleed uh, in a brainstem CCM. So this makes it imperative that these are treated. But the, uh, the, there are another two things to remember is that the risk of hemorrhage is uh, more in the first two years post This is what we call a hemorrhagic uh, hemorrhage clustering. And this risk after that comes down. The medium time to re-hemorrhage is around 10 and a half months. Almost 80% do recover with either full recovery or minimal disability. And the mortalities of a re-bleed is around 2.2%. So even among those patients with a re-bleed, there is a 20% chance that the patient is going to have a major disability. So, so when would you choose our observation? It's probably a good modality in incidentally de detected DSCMs or probably the best modality. An asymptomatic unbled BS uh, brainstem cavernous malformations. But you have to remember that if you're going for observation, there is going to be a significantly higher risk in brainstem cavernomas versus other cavernomas. For either the both for the primary bleed and for the deep bleed. So now when do we ask for surgery? So what I'll do is I'll just speak about surgery a little bit and then do the discussions. See, there is a lack of agreement for an incidentally de detected BSCM. So it's not recommended in asymptomatic cases. And the evidence for a surgery after a single hemorrhage continues to remain weak. But lots of authors nowadays uh, say that if you are going to resect a symptomatic brainstem cavernous malformations, if it is reaching an accessible file surface, or whether you have a safe surgical corridor. But an absolute indication would be repeat hemorrhages, clinical deterioration, and mass effect caused by hemorrhages. And what is the optimal timing? Again, there is a limited evidence. But the preferred 
phase would be the subacute phase that is 2 to 6 weeks after ictus during which the patient stabilizes and the hematoma liquefaction liquefaction occurs and it becomes easier to remove it the main goal is radical resection of the lesion as partial removal is associated with recurrent bleeds while pontine lesions are the commonest uh, ccms associated dvs have been reported in almost 30% and like already mentioned you need to have a good image guidance tractography intraoperative neuro monitoring etc to help identify the safe entry zone so this is what we call the 360 degrees i think all of you after seeing ipl would have been familiar with mr mr 360 so similarly here in uh, neurosurgery brain stem you can approach it by various angles you can either go from the frontal side using the uh, tyrional transylvian pretemporal approach or the subtemporal approach either with a uh, transtentorial etc or a crosses or a poppins approach or you could do a retrosig far lateral or a standard midline suboccipital cranial Uh, so these are the various approaches for the midbrain, anterior, anterolateral, and posterior. So you could either use the FTOZ, uh, the tyrional FTOZ, etc., or you could use a, a petrosectomy, subtemporal combined with a petrosectomy, or you could do a posterior petrosectomy with a retrolab, or you could use a process of Poppins modification. Similarly, in pons, you could come through 360 degrees and also the medulla. So, so this is a very good diagrammatic representation of what a selection of approach. and what is the exposure you achieve the subtemporal approach gives you a part of the midbrain here if you cut the tent you probably go up to the fifth nerve and if you do a, a anterior petrosectomy as described by kawase you probably you will go up to the seventh nerve similarly if you do a retromastoid craniotomy you will uh, re reach uh, these areas from the pons to the upper midbrain and do a far lateral approach you can go from the lower uh, pons to the uh medulla and the crosses approach gives gives you a good approach to the collicular region these are the lateral supracerebellar approaches and this is the telovelar approach so in short these are the various approaches you would like to use and once you reach the brain stem there are multiple safe zones uh, this is a very good diagrammatic representation i'm not going to the details so what you need to have is a good monitoring which i'll be showing you some videos about so these are the various approaches you could i see this is a, a colic a, a tectal uh, cavernoma this is a, a midbrain and pons cli pontine glioma this is a pontine glioma this is a pontine glioma again so all these have been approached in various ways and i'll discuss these uh, approaches yes, approaches so this is a classical pop uh, this is a classical uh, tectal plate glioma slightly off midline so what we did was we used a sitting position we used a c shaped position <laughs> so you have various monitors over here you need to see this is a very complicated position you have the mep ssep you have the transesophageal echo and you have the cvp line here and the head clamp what is important is that you have to position it such that the tent comes in a straight line and you we'll use a transesophageal echo to look for any clots and this is the uh, procedure here so once you get a good positioning what happens is once you cut one of the veins over there the the cerebellum falls down and you get a good view of the uh, posterior third ventricular region and here we are dissecting of the arachnoid carefully sharp dissection you have to realize that this thing is the this is the posterior third ventricular region it has four layers of arachnoids and now since the lesion is slightly off midline we are slightly coming lateral and uh, again sharp dissection you have to dissect the arachnoid very carefully a uh, navigation is very useful because it helps you uh, give you a very nice uh, uh, sense of uh, direction in the in this area so you can see that uh, the, there is a discoloration over here which is going to be probably a port of entry and you could also see the fourth nerve there here we entering the cavernoma and since you are operating in a operating at a time when the hematoma would have liquefied so what happens is when you enter the cavernoma the it starts the uh, liquefied blood comes out and this is very helpful and this is probably why the subacute hemorrhage state is preferred for surgery 
So once the hematoma is uh, evacuated, you look for the cavernoma, and that's the cavernoma which is coming into view. You go around the section, unlike a, a supratentorial uh, cavernoma in which the you have to excise the hemosiderin ring. It's not necessary to excise the hemosiderin ring because uh, it's not a seizurogenic in the brainstem. So what we are looking here to is to just remove the cavernoma. So the cavernoma can be either be taken out in full or piece skin. What is important to note is that you are seeing, you started seeing the normal brainstem tissue over here. So you have to use a combination of mild traction and uh, dissection to remove the cavernoma from the surrounding walls. And once the cavernoma is removed, we get a good uh, view of the cavity and hemostasis is done. So this is the post-op scan. So the other important thing is the use of mapping. So we had this 40-year-old uh, male with a pontine uh, cavernoma uh, where we use various monitors to uh, localize the point of entry. This is the cavernoma. As you can see, it's in the uh, midbrain and pons. And we use a standard uh, midline suboxical craniotomy. Uh, this is the baseline SSCP and MEPs. I'll just quickly skip this. This is the telovelar approach in which you are the, dissecting the fissure. This is the superior, superior medullary velum, which is being coagulated and cut. So once you cut the superior medullary velum and the choroid, uh, this choroid flexus, you can see the brain stem. And this is the brain stem here. And here we're going to do the mapping. And you can see that when you touch the facial colliculus, you get the stimulation. So what we do is, even though the uh, cavernoma is towards the midline, you do a slightly lateral incision because otherwise you'll risk injuring the facial colliculus. You go slightly lateral, and then that's the point of entry for the cavernoma. And the cavernoma is excised as like men, like I mentioned in the previous case, that the hematoma, that's the cavernoma which is coming into view. So like I mentioned, the cavernoma is excised uh, piecemeal here. Uh, it's a little dangerous to try to excise it in toto in the brainstem, so you have to be careful about it. The resection cavity is examined to look that there is no residue. You could add an endoscope like we did in our later cases to just to check a, a view of the complete cavity. And once the uh, hemostasis is done, So the cavity is completely free of any residual lesion. And that's the hemostasis. And again, you just have a relook at the. You see that the facial colliculus is uh, preserved. So that is the seventh nerve. And then the uh, surgery is done. No changes in the MAP and SSCP throughout the surgery. So this gives an importance as to why the uh, uh, why mapping is very important. This is another telovelar approach. I'll not go into this. For example, this is another complicated case in which is there the pawns, but as you can see, it's in relation to the tent. So we decided to do, even though it was approachable here, there's a rim of normal tissue. So we decided to come with a subtemporal uh, transtentorial approach. So this is the tent. I'm not showing the video. I'll just show some uh, the, uh, snapshots. This is a tentorium edge. The tentorium edge is cut. So once the tentorium edge is cut, you can see the cavernoma surfacing over here. Further uh, uh, 
uh, evacuate here we evacuate and since this cavernum was quite big we had to go down further so the tentorium is cut fully and you're getting a wide exposure over here that's the fourth nerve and again a dissection and piecemeal appearance and the cavernoma is removed so this is the pre op scan and this is the post op scan so the, similarly this is another patient uh, with an anti which is surfacing and yeah sorry i just so we did the retro lab approach for this so the outcomes is that uh, the majority of the patients have an improved outcome at follow up compared to the pre operative status and the unfavorable risk factors i mentioned over here this lotus bscm grading system has been used by many centers to look at the outcome profile but when you re review surgical literature the one thing is common even though the fresh deficits are around 30 to 40% the long term morbidity varies anywhere between 11 uh, between uh, 10 to 20% and the mortality is low especially in the newer series and there is one complication which is seen in both surgical and gamma knife that is the hypertrophic olivary de de degeneration so our experience around 82 brain stem cavernomas like i mentioned here uh, we as a policy in an institute even though we are doing gamma knife from 2006 we do not use gamma knife so this comes to the radio surgery which dr gupta has mentioned so i will just uh, go, just have a two two slides on this uh, the the question is the, the efficacy of gamma knife itself is controversial because we do not know uh, exactly how to check it the mean rates of volume reduction have been reported between 30 to 80% but whether the shrinkage of the bulk is actually by induced uh, radiation or because the hematoma resolving is quite so open to question uh, the optimal dose also has been controversial the initial studies they used higher doses so there was significant increase in collateral edema the dose has come down and recent studies have shown a use around 11 to 12 grams if you look out uh, at various studies in brain stem cavernous malformations what you see is that the two year bleed has been between uh, 4 to 33% but after 2 years the rate of hemorrhage has actually come down and also if you see the radiation related complications which was initially 35 to 41% has come down to uh, 2 to 11% so it's not a bad result uh, but we this is one experience we had which was a very bad experience this was at the time of uh, presentation this was one year after srs and this was after three years after srs where the cavernoma is actually not resolved so the summary and lessons learned from gkrs is that the complication rates were unacceptably high the dose and planning methods have undergone changes avoiding the hemosiderin ring reducing the dose to approximately 12 grams and avoiding the dva the maximum reduction is after 12 years so the rate of rebleed in the first two years is quite high and because the clustering of hemorrhages occurs in the first 2 years the patient is open to risk but after 2 years there's a definite decrease in risk after gamma knife and the radiation induced complications so if you look at the outright co comparison between gamma knife and surgery you see that the rebleed rate is lower in surgery and this is only for a residual lesion the permanent deficits are also comparable but what gamma knife does is it adds the radiation side effects and also the rebleed rates in the first 2 years so this comes back to me the conundrum of the maslow's hammer and the problem is that when you make a decision uh, you make the decision based on the tool you have so if you have gamma knife the whole thing looks gamma knifeable if you know only surgery everything you want to go in for surgery so this is if you have a hammer the world looks like a nail so the comparison between gamma knife and uh, surgery is almost like apples and oranges because Uh, selection there is a selection bias based on the surgical experience based on the uh, based on the surfacing of the lesion and also that larger lesions tend to go in for surgery while smaller volume lesions deep seated lesions and which are uh, not possible for surgery have unacceptably high complications go in for gamma knife and also there has been an evolution of dosimetry and planning so this is a small management suggestion which was given by fisher et al that in patients with brain stem cavernomas if there is no significant hemorrhage no symptoms do conservative treatment if there is hemorrhage reaching the pile surface going for surgery if it's deep uh, deep seated but if it's still a microsurgical corridor is available going for surgery if it is small lesion with a microsurgically high risk gamma knife can be considered this is controversial but i think probably the class 2b and level b evidence does exist that small symptomatic uh, lesions which have undergone symptomatic hemorrhage previously in inaccessible locations and unacceptably high surgical risk 
can be given gamma nine. But surgery does remain the gold standard for accessible lesion which have bled or asymptomatic. Otherwise, you could just follow it up, and you do get reasonably good outcomes. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daraknat, uh, for uh, reconfirming what Dr. Gupta said that uh, though he presented on gamma knife, that uh, surgery is better than gamma knife, uh, and uh, gamma knife has specific special indications. Um, we'll have the discussion in, the, in later, and uh, I'll now invite Professor Suresh Nair uh, to speak on a similar subject on multiple hemangioblastomas, uh, what to do with the asymptomatic ones. So, Professor Suresh Nair is uh, is ex dean and and chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute, Trivandrum, India. Professor Nair, can you please share your screen? Please? Yeah. Are you seeing mine? Uh, we see you, sir. Not presentation. One minute. One minute. Let me see. Are you seeing now? Mm, no. No, no, sir. Sir, okay. share screen option is there below, sir. Now? Are you seeing now? No, sir. After you share screen, you have to select the slides, select the presentation. I have already selected. I have shared. No, yes. Are, yes. Okay, fine. Are you seeing now? Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, we are seeing your desktop. Okay, okay. One minute. You are seeing now? Yes. Okay. Let me start. One minute. Okay, you are seeing now, no? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. At the outset, I should thank uh, uh, Manas for giving me this opportunity to talk on uh, management of multiple hemantiblastomas. And as you see in the slide, I got help from Manjul Tripadi from PGI Chandigarh who made some of the slides for me and also my old colleague Adesh at Ames Bhopal and my colleague, old colleague Prakash Nair from Tripadram. And these are the headings. I will try to run through all this a brief history of VHL disease and something about molecular biology, some clinical vignettes which we will discuss towards the end. How do you manage multiple hemangioblastomas? These are the various things, observation, surgery, variation, a condition called hemangiomatosis. And what are the medical management options and some take-home message? So hemangioblastoma, they're uncommon tumors in the CNS. They're WHO grade one tumor, usually affects middle-aged adults, slight male preponderance. They present sporadically, 70% of the cases. Or in the context of... Uh, VHL disease in 35 to 40 percent of the cases. While sporadic lesions are more common, usually large, single presentation between 30, 60, or 5 years of age, VHL lesions are multiple, smaller in size, younger individuals, presentation of either variety, same in the posterior fossa, headache, cerebellar dysfunction, hydrocephalus. So, multiple hemangioblastomas always occur in the setting of. VHL, von Hippel Lindow disease. Something about the history. See, Eugene von Hippel described, this is a German ophthalmologist, first described angiomatosis of the retina. Later, Bailey and Cushing, they introduced the term hemangioblastoma. But what was interesting is they divided vascular malformations into two, angiomatous malformations and hemangioblastoma. So hemangioblastoma was included under uh, angiomatous malformation, vascular malformation by Bailey and Cushing. Later, two years, three years later, Swedish pathologist Lindo, he showed neoplastic elements in hemangioblastoma and he linked the retinal angiomas to cerebellar lesion. And uh, much later in 1964, uh, the term VHL, bone hippel Lindo disease was coined. So what about uh, uh, the natural history, the natural history of, uh, 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 say, what we have told is uh, natural history is, you know, it is an autosomal disorder with 90% penetrance and the tumors, they reside both inside and outside the neuraxis and CNS manifestations include 
not only hemangioblastomas in the brain stem and cerebellum, but also in the spinal cord, nerve root, endolymphatic sac tumor, and also in the retina. So these are the, some of the diagnostic criteria of VHL in cases with positive family history of retinal or CNS hemangioblastoma. A VHL diagnosis requires presence of only one hemangioblastoma. In cases with negative family history of CNS or retinal hemangioblastoma, the diagnosis requires presence of multiple hemangioblastoma or one hemangioblastoma and one visceral manifestation. There are various types, types with clear cell carcinoma and types with the pheochromocytoma. I won't discuss that. What are the molecular features? 80% are due to of VHL syndrome is uh, due to a familial neoplastic condition caused by germline mutation of tumor suppressor gene. It's called the VHL gene, located in the short arm of chromosome 3. 20% of these cases could be from de novo mutation. And what, what does this uh, uh, VHL gene do? So there is a VHL gene protein called PVHL. It plays an important role in regulation of hypoxia pathways. So in the absence of this PVHL, hypoxia inducible factors get stabilized and leading to sustained expression of various pro-tumorogenic molecules. That is VEGF, PDGF, erythropoietin, TGF, alpha, everything, it uh, promotes activation of all this and subsequently this upregulated target factors lead to rapid proliferation, tumorogenesis and angiogenesis. This is what happens in uh, hemangioblastomas. So the molecular diagnosis can be in VHL, in 87% of the cases you can have a, a, a molecular diagnosis. That means in 13 cases of proved VHL clinically, you still may not have this uh, molecular aberration. And this is the essential difference uh, between sporadic and VHL. VHL is usually younger decades, multiple tumors, mostly in the spinal cord and cerebellum, and other visceral manifestations are there. This is just to show a sporadic and VHL uh, natural history. This is, you know, VHL patients, obviously, they don't do well. Why they don't do well, even though the cause of death is same, why they don't do well is uh, uh, they develop so many new tumors, uh, which is uh, the cause of death in these patients. Some of the clinical vignettes which I want to discuss is, this is a girl presenting with, I will discuss in the end, but just to show, presenting with progressive quadriparesis, bentinen, no headache, cerebellar signs, but having one lesion in the cerebellum sizable, I will show DSAs in the end with a large lesion in the spinal cord for this patient is symptomatic. Which one will you operate first? Will you operate on the spinal lesion or on the cerebellar lesion? And the second one is a case of VHL disease patient that's an anterior medial, more than 3.5 centimeter or 4 centimeter hemangioblastoma, but also has got a renal cell carcinoma. So this is a VHL disease. We have to take into account the patient, not the number of patients in the cerebellum. What will you do for such a patient? And last three, this is some of the cases which keep on coming. Small list and operated 91, again came back in 2001, again operated 2007, 2008. Every time we operate, do we have any uh, things other than upfront radiation after repeat excision? Is there any role for chemotherapy? I will try to address all this. Before that, now what are the management strategies of uh, uh, hemangioblastoma? So one is observation, other is surgical excision with or without embolization, then radiotherapy, conventional and stereotactic radiosurgery, and some medical treatment. So this is the most important slide of the whole my talk. This is why Lonser, which has come in Journal of Neurosurgery, 2014 NIH group. This is prospectively followed 225 cases of hemangioblastoma for seven years. And what is highlighted, this original lesion out of the 225, 51% didn't grow, but 49% grew. And what other thing is that, uh, what about the tumor types of tumor growth? He found three types of tumor growth. It was saltatory in 72%. Linear in 6% and 
and the exponential in 22%. So what is important is nearly 75% of the cases, they show slow periods of growth and then long periods of dormancy. Another important thing is most of the patients, in spite of uh, uh, showing a growth, 94% of the patients, they remain asymptomatic. Very few patients develop secondary symptoms from mass effect, either by expansion of the lesion or cyst. And so this was the most important slide. You, original lesions, 51% did not grow, 49% grew. And many other patients, they have a saltatory type of growth. Linear growth was seen only in 6%. And another finding is, at the end of the study, 72% of the patients, of the 225 patients, they develop new lesions. So new lesions, these people keep on developing. But among the original lesion, 51% did not grow and 49% only grew. And many of the patients which uh, grew, they remained asymptomatic. So growth pattern of hemangioblastoma is unpredictable. It can remain dormant, as I told you. It can have accelerated growth or a stuttering growth. So there is no definite clinical, radiographic, or specific molecular markers to predict the natural history of an individual patient. So how about observation and surveillance? Uh, so let us see. This is one uh, uh, graphic presentation where you can see uh, the volume of the tumor and the rate of growth. You, you can see many of these uh, uh, patients, they remain in spite of growth. They, uh, in spite of increase in volume, they remain dormant for many, many years. So there is no need to jump on surgery instantaneously. So rate of progression and baseline tumor volume, you have to just have an idea of that, but that won't decide the management. So this is what uh, Ammerman in the study, he has found that in a decade uh, long experience, he found that all of the tumors demonstrated some evidence of radiographic progression, but only half of them required therapy. That could be either surgery or radio surgery in a decade long interval. So many of the patients, the many of the tumors, they don't show any symptom in spite of growth. But suppose one decides to manage solely on radiographic progression, there would be four additional procedures per patient in a 10 year period. So which is not warranted or indicated. So some surveillance protocols have come. So this is, you know, if you have a patient who has a hemangioblastoma, which shows some radiological progression, what you should do, or any patient with or without radiological progression. These are some of the guidelines. You have to clinically evaluate that patient every year, MRI of the neuraxis every second year, and the audiology every second year, because some of the patients can develop endolymphatic sac tumor also. So these are some of the guidelines given. And uh, now coming to the next option, which is a surgical management. It is the treatment of choice. You know, for a sporadic hemangioblastoma, it is the treatment of choice. And, uh, and also, it's a gross total resection and decompression of the cyst. It's not resection of the cyst. It is a wrong thing which I have written. So treatment of choice for symptomatic lesions, wherever it is, if possible, in a resectable location. The surgery is the best treatment of choice. I will skip this video for want of time. Otherwise, this was just a video, but I think all of us know how to do. So what to do if there is a radiological progression of the disease with clinical deterioration, what I am telling, you have to do surgery or radio surgery of the uh, symptomatic lesion and radiological progression without clinical deterioration, one can observe as with the guideline which I told you. So what is the radio surgical management? You have, it can be either primary for deep-seated tumors, which are risk for high risk for microsurgery, or it could be adjuvant treatment for residual tumors with subtotal resection, or it could be salvage treatment, tumor occurrence in patients with prior radiotherapy. But you know, evidence is very poor. No, it's not well-powered prospective studies, so role of SRS as a treatment modality. So radiotherapy, as I was telling, can be a first line recommended for unresectable tumor, 
or medically uh, inoperable cases or multifocal cases. Two studies I will tell. One is a study from Neuro-Oncology 2010. The result of that thing, progression-free survival after gamma knife surgery was uh, at two years, 91%, decreasing to 61% and 51% at 10 years and 15 years. Came with a small price, edema, cystic degeneration in the spinal cord and cerebellum, and progression of small size lesion occurred still, and radio surgery uh, only for high, that was the conclusion, radio surgery could, should opt only for high risk surgical lesion. Another study, this came in 2014, and so this is uh, results of radio surgery and LINAC based fractionated radiotherapy, tumor control rates of 98%, 88%, and 73% at one, two, and six years. So this is what about surgery in SRS failure cases, they like what we have in acoustic schwannoma. And so people tell that surgery after acoustic schwannoma, after failed SRS is difficult. So this is, you know, I got this slide from Manjuli telling there is no evidence in literature and this personal experience is there is no difficulty in surgical dissection of a patient who had gamma knife if the tumor is increasing in size. And this is regarding spinal hemangioblastoma. Is there any role for radiation? So this is from a single center. They have four publications. But uh, again, it is a follow-up for one to three years. 56% reduced in size. 42% remained stable and 2% progressed in size. So this is a single institute retrospective analysis of cyber knife radio surgery. So SRS for spinal hemangioblastoma, it is a standard treatment for uh, spinal uh, hemangioblastoma is still surgery. SRS may be used as an adjuvant therapy for residual or recurrent lesion. SRS as an upfront therapy cannot be assessed at present in view of the limited literature evidence. And now coming to the last management medical options. Uh, say you will see hemangioblastomas can recur even after total removal even after 10 years after first surgery. And which group of patients it recurs more common in males, symptom onset prior to 30 years of age, presenting with multiple patients of hemangioblastoma who present with multiple small, solid lesions. And they have, people have found that pathologically, if there are lower proportion of lipid-laden stromal cells and high stromal eosinophil cell count, if these are the tumors which are likely to recur, so what are the medical options for multiple hemangioblastoma? And also pathologically, people have found there are two histological variants, a reticular and cellular variant. Reticular, they are stromal cells evenly distributed around vascular network. Cellular, stromal cells are arranged in larger sheets or clusters. So probability of recurrence is more in cellular than in the reticular type. And also, those, those tumors will show higher proportion of GFAP and lose uh, MIB index is more than 4%. They are likely to recur. So, the hemangioblastomosis is a rare complication of both sporadic and VHL hemangioblastoma, characterized by diffuse leptomangian spread. The exact mechanism is still unknown. Very few cases reported. But uh, dissemination of CSF is postulated to be an implicating factor. This I have taken from the literature since I do not have a case. And medical management, because I have told this hypoxia inducible factors, uh, they, can, uh, uh, they, they can actually be GF, PD, GF, TGF, alpha, all will get expressed. And all these things have been tried, BGF receptor antagonist, EGFR antagonist is approved by uh, FDA. Timosolamide has been tried. Thalidomide has been tried. Even beta blocker, somatostatin, analogs, and other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. All of these things have been tried for uh, multiple hemangioblastoma, which recur, keeps on recurring at multiple places. This veneer, I will tell now, this is a girl presenting with the progressive quadriparesis, no headache, cerebellar side. And this is the MR of the spine, which shows large syrinx. We are seeing a 
lesion inside the brain stem, inside the spinal cord, other in the cerebellum. And uh, this is a proved, this is a known case of VHL. And you can see the contrast enhancing lesion in the spinal cord. And also you have seen the contrast enhancing lesion in the cerebellum. This is the angiogram which shows the cerebellar lesions fed by ICA and PICA. And this was removed. Uh, first, we, the first, you know, we were wondering whether to remove the uh, spinal cord lesion because patient was symptomatic for that and virtually asymptomatic for this large uh, uh, cerebellar lesion. But then we went and removed this the tumor first for fear of uh, uh, herniation. That is why we thought we will remove it. And subsequently, we went and removed this uh, uh, spinal lesion. And this is the, this also we do we have we have a very good uh, neuroradiology sister department they embolize this patient post embolization and uh, and this is how we removed and uh, let me see whether I can run it and uh, all of us know the uh, surgical principles of uh, uh, just like AVM surgery you have to go to the uh, peritumoral gliotic sort and uh, both in the cerebellum or wherever it is. And then deliver the tumor. Go to the and the cells as they come, you have to coagulate. You can see the whole tumor coming out. And then the last chunk of tumor is being coagulated and removed. So this patient did extremely well. Uh, this is this patient who was in Nuric grade 3 and who could walk with support after surgery. Patient had many other lesions which we are observing this patient. This is the second case which I was telling you. This is a VHL case with the renal cell carcinoma because whenever you treat a VHL case with hemangioblastoma, you have to take the picture of the whole patient. A large, more than three centimeter a renal cell carcinoma, a four centimeter anterior medial. Normally they are posteriorly placed. Here you can see it is just the anterior medial location, these tumors are pile based, how to remove it and which one you remove, the renal cell carcinoma first or this one first. So we thought the other thing was still contained, even though it was more than three centimeters. We know that one can do a nephron sparing, a, a partial nephrectomy, we went for this case first. And how we thought this is again our uh, uh, the, this lesion is not surfacing posteriorly. It's so difficult with embolization is, you know, ventrally placed brainstem, these lesions. Feeders also supply the brainstem structure. So these things I will uh, remove. This how, uh, what normally we do. And up, how do we approach these lesions? Very difficult. Ventrally placed. So we have a trans labyrinthine approach. We can do under circulatory errors. We can do subtemporal trans tendorial occipitally in the hemispheric, various approaches. So first one of the cases, similar location, I, we didn't in our institute with circulatory arrest, but we lost that patient. Unlike acoustic neuronoma, where you can go and decompress and then make the capsule flat, here we cannot do anything. So in this patient, embolization of ICA feeders was attempted, but abandoned and super selective catheterization failed. We did a retrosigmoid suboccipital approach and we removed the lateral third of the cerebellum, total excision we could do, elective ventilation we did for 48 hours and then controlled with hypertension patient did extremely well without any problem. This is the post-op picture. And this is what you do, keep on recurring. Amenthioblastoma, especially cystic ones which we see more with VHL disease. Keep on recurring. Every time you remove, give radiation then becoming very large, same patient only. So as I told, there are some medical management if it keeps on recurring after surgical excision and radiotherapy, which I have told you, and FDA have approved some of these medication. And this is what we did, the embolization, every time we used to operate. So this patient underwent uh, multiple times suboccipital craniectomy. Sometimes we used to inject uh, fibrin glue and cyanoacrylate into the tumor. Uh, to control bleeding, circumferential excision, end block excision. And take home message from my presentation, lifetime risk of retinal and cerebellar hemangioblastomas and 
renal cell carcinoma is always there in patients with VHL disease. They are the people who come with multiple hemangioblastoma. Affected individuals and their relatives should be offered screening right from childhood. So if suppose, we know that many of these tumors, they don't grow. And they grow, but they remain asymptomatic. And even if they grow, it's saltatory only. And rate of growth and absolute size, they, they do not indicate symptoms at all. That is more, we have to follow these patients all the time. And onset of symptom with increase in size of tumor or cyst is the indicator for the intervention. And surgery is the first line treatment for a symptomatic resectable lesion. I think, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Nayak, for uh, uh, for giving a lucid lecture on uh, on hemangioblastomas and uh, and giving the take home message that surgery is the best way to do and radiological progression uh, is not an indication for surgery; it's the symptoms which is more important. Absolutely. Um, and so we have a case for discussion. Dr. Jankov is uh, will be presenting a case of hemangioblastoma for discussion. Uh, on the panel, followed by Dr. Dev Pujari and Dr. Kohos. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Naku is there. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, can you please uh, share your screen? Uh, we don't see you. It. Here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, those were lovely lectures, and this segues very nicely from Dr. Nair's lecture. This was a 27-year-old male whose mother had von Hippel-Lindau disease, and he was diagnosed as well. In 2014, he underwent a suboccipital craniotomy for a superficial hemangioblastoma. Resected successfully, he did very well. He underwent an embolization of a dural fistula, type 2 dural AV fistula, located primarily along the transverse sinus uh, right above the surgical exposure two years later due to a, a throbbing pulsatile tinnitus he noted in his head. I, at the end of my presentation, I'd love to know if any of you have seen associated dural AV fistulas with hemangioblastomas. I've seen three in my career. So this 27-year-old uh, this male was doing well. Uh, until he presented asymptomatically with a new lesion on screening MR. Here you can see the flare on the left side of the screen, the contrast enhanced MRI on, on the right side of the screen with this two and a half centimeter uh, deep seated cerebellar, cerebellar lesion. To the best of our knowledge, this appeared to be a new hemangioblastoma deep to the initial surgical resection. And here's the sagittal and coronal imaging showing this it's laying right beneath the tent. Uh, because of his history of a prior dural AV fistula uh, that had been embolized elsewhere, I did a catheter-based angiogram. I did not see any residual evidence of an AV fistula. However, certainly you can see the vascular outline of this hemangioblastoma. Another question I'll ask the, the audience if, if anybody would consider preoperative embolization or embolization alone for some of these uh, hemangioblastomas that are particularly vascular or have accessible feeders. So the treatment, uh, as, as we discussed, uh, radio surgery, a, a redo suboccipital surgery. He had a, uh, an ipsilateral paramedian incision, so it would be a redo surgery through that uh, bed. Standard open versus port-based, uh, potential endovascular embolization alone or in conjunction with surgery. And then finally, as we did, as Dr. Nair so, so eloquently pointed out, perhaps for someone who is asymptomatic with simple radiographic progression or new occurrence, maybe observation would be key. Uh, so I mean, I'd like to actually pose it to Dr. Nair. Would you observe this lesion, or I have audible. If patient is uh, asymptomatic, I will observe only, uh, because uh, because you know we uh, because you know even if you uh, the, he, he has every chance of developing much many more lesions. So as and when he becomes symptomatic, I will take it out. And the uh, other thing is there is no role for uh, embolization as a treatment option. It is an adjuvant treatment. And as I told you, uh, those lesions which are in the depth and anterior medially located, uh, the vessels can supply uh, also the critical structure. So even embolization is a risky procedure. But otherwise, my 
answer to your question is observation if patient is uh, asymptomatic. Well said. Uh, Dr. Shermer, would you agree with that plan? And, and uh, either way, have you attempted embolizing these lesions either uh, alone as a de novo procedure or in conjunction with other uh, more definitive management? Clement? Sorry, say that again. Uh, I was wondering if, if you ha if if you agree with observation and regardless of whether you agree with that or not, have you tried to, attempted to embolize these lesions, highly vascular hemangioblastomas, either as a standalone treatment or in conjunction with other treatment? So I, I yeah, I mean I, I would agree with uh, the first part, and I'll tell you about the embolization. Um, you know, we have actually developed so like a method of. Um, you know, doing essentially like an open direct stick embolization, uh, which avoids a lot of the complications of the trans arterial approach. Um, and it gives you so like the embolization at the time that you need it during the surgery, uh, really as an adjunct, um, rather than, you know, doing something that uh, incurs more, um, you know, morbidity uh, in excess of what the benefit is, uh, which is really for the surgeon's convenience, right? Because uh, most of these you can somehow deal with on a surgical basis, um, but it just becomes really, really complicated and uh, has uh, a lot of propensity for um, significant morbidity and more potentially mortality, I suppose. Um, so th those would be my, my uh, uh, tenets here. Thank you. And Dr. Bain, do you have experience with posterior fossa port-based surgery? And would you consider a port-based approach for something like this? So good question. Uh, I would say uh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, I think, you know, I, I think that, you know, the way I approach these is that these are AVMs, um, you know, uh, just like Dr. Nair said. And I think uh, this would be a very large lesion to take on with a port. Um, so I, I would not um, uh, at all. I wouldn't even consider it. Uh, I don't think I'm that confident yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, so after an extensive discussion with this healthy 27-year-old, he can, wanted to be... Can I be... just comment on this? Oh, please, please. Uh, see, as the problem is this uh, lesion is not a solid lesion. It's, a, it's got two cystic components. And the cystic components are quite big. The problem with predicting the linear growth pattern of hemangioblastomas is that the growth pattern when it's cystic is different from when it is completely solid and small. So even though the patient is asymptomatic, there is a chance that the cystic component can suddenly increase in size and the patient can recruit. And since this is in a posterior fossa, you have a very small amount of time uh, and the fourth ventricle, actually to see the flare images, the fourth ventricle is almost uh, is getting the... Uh, there is some... Uh, narrowing of the fourth ventricle. So I think for this, especially when this is in the hemispheres, I think surgery would be the best option. And I, I, don't, I don't think we would wait for this lesion to become symptomatic and then operate. Well, you are, you are certainly a visionary and I will, I give you kudos for predicting this, this ultimate failure of the way we treated the patient. We, we ultimately opted for radio surgery uh, because the patient was asymptomatic but wanted to be proactive about treatment, consider, particularly considering this was a, a second lesion in, in the same surgical bed. So we administered 18 gray to the 50% isodose back on December 20th. And as you might have predicted, uh, eight weeks after surgery, he returns with headaches, imbalance, coordination issues, increasing edema, more mass effect. You can see the fourth ventricle is now nearly completely obstructed. And it was the cystic component that, that continued to grow and expand in, the, in that short eight weeks. So I'm, not, I'm not insinuating it's related to the radio surgery, but be interested to hear if anybody has comments otherwise, but ultimately I felt at that point that a, a redo surgical resection through the, through the prior paramedian incision was warranted. Yeah, Brian, I kind of I kind of agree with with the comments. Uh, you know, I, I think that a posterior fossa lesion, you just have such a narrow window uh, for deterioration, uh, and with that amount of edema, I, I would have been very nervous about uh, not to be critical, but I'd been very nervous about gaminitis. I think I think an upfront surgery, even though it was a redo surgery, I think was probably the best option. Easy to say now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I I would agree with you. 
Thank you. And for I the would also maybe add that it, it doesn't seem to me that you know the just the growth of that cyst, but but more so that there seems to be so like edema and maybe dynamic in the amount of edema that was driving that rather than the you know specific size increase of the cystic portion. Okay. Clemens, hey, Clemens, can I ask you a question? When you're doing that um, that sort of the intraop uh, direct stick uh, embolization, are you doing that under X-ray guidance or are you just just visually? Uh, we do that under X-ray guidance. Um, okay. So we essentially try and um, you know place you know I mean I'm I'm glancing over some details here, but we place a needle into the solid portion of the tumor. We inject some contrast, make sure that you are actually where you think you are, and it's a good vascular target. And then we um, embolize that uh, uh, portion of it. Um, and then you can rinse and repeat by moving the needle. Um, and that can uh, you know, be pretty uh, effectful in, in some of these areas where you don't have really good surgical access um, up front. Um, and uh, you can be, you know, pretty careful. And I've, I've found this to be working really well in a hybrid room, I suppose, but you can do this with just a fluoroscope, um, you know, the, the way we did angiograms, intraoperative angiograms, uh, old style. Um, and there's some like slight innovations that we uh, um, came up with um, around the idea that um, you're so like flooding the whole tumor with D5 um, and you're not having the NBCA uh, um, uh, so like uh, fall out um, and uh, harden uh, exactly when it comes out the needle, but like, you know, have a little bit more penetration of the um, vascular portion of this tumor. How about the association with Duralevi fistulas or PLAV fistulas for that matter? I'm curious if anybody's anecdotally noted this association or if you think it was simply a sequela of the primary surgery. I have not seen, I have not seen uh, Duralevi fistula. I, I think that's a tough <laughs> one. I, I think that's that falls to me still under the correlation does not necessarily imply causation in any way or form um, territory. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, miss, the results are similar to in a cystic schwannoma where radio surgery doesn't work well. Um, in the cystic uh, hemangioblastoma or cystic schwannoma, radio surgery probably will not be the first option, uh, as uh, Dr. Bharatnath was uh, pointing out. Uh, and I'll request to Dev Pujari to present uh, a case to initiate discussion. Uh, Dr. Dev Pujari. I have a couple of cases just to talk about uh, recurrent bleed in a cavernous angioma, pontine cavernous angioma, uh, and the cystic uh, angioma, and another case of a familial uh, angioma. So if uh, if you can unshare the screen, please. Done. Uh, so this is a about a 52 year old gentleman who actually uh, came to us with uh, unsteadiness uh, for a few days before he came here uh, is it visible yes and am i audible yes Right. So this gentleman came with uh, an episode of diplopia and uh, unsteadiness and had this cystic lesion uh, on the scan he came with. We were not sure what we were dealing with and uh, we repeated his scans. You can see an anterior pontine lesion uh, with some hypodense margin, but it was actually the GRE sequences which told us that there was a definite uh, bleed in this lesion and uh, we performed a, a DTI to make sure what would be the best approach to get it uh, and we did a venogram to see if we could uh, uh, go for a retro sig approach uh, or we could go a pre-sigmoid approach. Uh, as you can see that the left side is the dominant uh, side and we thought we would uh, go by a retrosig approach. 
this is the position which we use for a retro sig approach and uh, this is what we did uh this is a regular uh, retromastoid craniotomy and uh, there's a lot of uh, veins at the root entry zone of the fifth nerve we decided to go just below the fifth uh, which you can see here and an incision was made uh, just below that in the anterior pons uh we localized it of course with the help of navigation with dti and uh, to save time i am just proceeding further and uh, you got into the lesion you got some clot out and of course uh, it's not a very good uh, approach to look into the depth but uh, we thought we got the lesion out completely you can see the wall of the lesion being uh, picked up and uh, being taken out and at uh, the cavity virtually collapsed at the end of this uh i avoid putting any kind of uh, hemostatic uh, surgery cell and this is the post operative scan and the patient come out unscathed as you can see uh he has regular eye movements and he could walk and he was shifted back to the room within 24 hours uh so uh basically the uh approach uh, just below the fifth into the corridor between the fifth and the seventh nerve is a very good corridor and uh, <clears throat> cystic cavernomas are not regularly described in zabramski's classification but as the luck would have it on the fourth post operative day this patient got worse developed a proper cp angle syndrome fifth and seventh and uh, ataxia and this is the recurrent bleed we did his dsa at this time to see if we had missed any other lesion which was uh, normal and uh, we went ahead and operated on this chap again opened out the incision got through the same corridor and uh, you can see that uh, there is a bleed which has been removed almost completely and this time we got a much better vision maybe because of the uh time elapsed and uh, there wasn't too much edema in spite of the bleed and we could see uh the cavity quite well we have attempted to use endoscope uh, and i have preferred a pre sigmoid approach in this location mainly because you can see better and uh, this time again we got a good uh, ct scan uh, we didn't do an mri at this time as well but this chap has recovered completely well so the question is the role of post operative scan and uh, what is your experience with uh, uh, doing post operative mri scans and uh, having a recurrent bleed in this region let's make a comment you know i i think um you know we we always do post operative mris but you know it's always i don't think it really to be honest with you changes your management much i think that you know you go in to do a safe surgery if you saw this a little piece of cavernous malformation there you know is that cavernous malformation is a post operative hemorrhage it's hard to tell um i don't know if i would take a patient back um you know just for a little piece that was that that maybe left behind just considering the risk of doing that so I, to be honest with you we get them uh but i don't know if it dictates our management uh to be honest with you so um i i certainly think you know down the road you need it obviously once the blood is resolved uh months later but i, I don't know if an mri would have changed what you did here right i have particular yeah, would... observed we we have treated about six cystic cavernomas and two of them have rebled and we had to take them back for surgery so i think this is a variety of cavernoma where you need to be probably more sure that you have got the complete uh, cavernoma out but i i would like to know if uh, you would approach it in some other way or uh, 
because post operative mri can be fallacious you 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 cannot right. be absolutely sure that uh, yeah i think i think the approach is perfect and uh, i agree with you the mri comment i think we get it to see if there's any problems or anything but i, I don't think i would take a patient back the other thing i try to do i agree it's, it's hard to see the depths of that cavity so i've you know i always try to you know, get a little dental mirror or those little microscopic mirrors you can put in to see back on the upper edges and things. It's always hard. They're always too big. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, tried to use, um, uh, you know, Mike Lawton always uses that little uh, uh, lit up suction that has a little LED light at the tip. So I've tried to use that right. for better visualization. That always doesn't seem to work all that well either. It seems very big. Um, the only other thing I've tried recently is there's a, um, uh, this, that, in my presentation, I was showing that Myriad device. There's this little, that little chomper suction uh, device. There is one that has an LED light on it. That's called Novus. Um, I have used that in one uh, cavernous brain stem cavernous malformation. Um, I, you know, I, again, I, I think it lit up the field well, but uh, you know, I think it was, I was a little worried about how aggressive it was because it aspirates, it cuts. So I didn't want it to be too aggressive in the brainstem. So I don't know. I don't think there's a great answer. Yeah, I, I thought about the endoscope too to look around. I don't know. It's hard to, without opening it all up and seeing it, it, it sometimes you leave stuff behind, you know. I don't have a great answer for it. We usually get an MR done after about three months, but uh, this patient was just before the COVID pandemic and uh, he's still waiting for his MR. Uh, what do you think it is about the cystic lesions that cause them to hemorrhage more post-operatively? Absolutely. So I I think uh, we we just looked at this, and uh, I think one of the theories of uh, cyst formation is recurrent minor hemorrhages, and maybe these lesions are more prone to uh, uh, recurrent hemorrhages, and that's why you need to make sure that you get it out completely. Which becomes a little difficult in a pontine lesion, especially when it is anteriorly placed. So that was the difficulty in treating. This is another patient. Uh, yeah. Sir, if I may yeah. Sir, if I no. may comment. Sir. Yeah. Sure. No, no, sir, I feel that the lesion was surfacing anterolaterally. Yes. And the problem with the retromastoid approach is that you're almost parallel or slightly off parallel, and we meet the lesion. It's like a almost two parallel tracks trying to meet at around 30 degrees. Correct. For a better visualization inside the cavity, if you go to a retromastoid, the angles between, uh, let's say, the 70, 70, 80 degrees almost blind to you. The problem with cystic cavernomas is that the cavernoma gets compressed and pushed to one side and easy to miss them. Probably if you had done a transtentorial, a subtemporal transtentorial approach, you would have got a, perhaps a better visualization during the first surgery. And... Uh, I, I, I think I showed a case, the snapshots was a similar case. Uh, even though it was surfacing posteriorly, we went perpendicular to the uh, lesion because it gives you a better visualization in the system. And, and yeah, Dr. Parithos also was commenting that in uh, a better visualization probably will reduce the incidence of weep blade. But I have asked a question to Dr. S.K. Gupta. Uh, if, if you find a residual lesion if this at three months, uh, do you go for, is it justified to go for radio surgery because they present, he presented on radio surgery for cavern, brainstem cavernoma. If this cystic lesion, there is no re-bleed, come back with the three months with a small residual, whether it is justified to observe, re-operate or go for radio surgery. Dr. Gupta. Just in terms of approach, I would just like to make a comment that another lesion like this, I have approached through a pre-sigmoid approach here because uh, it was a dominant sinus. I did not. Uh, I I don't know. On the left side, I was a little bit worried about going subtemporal. But yes, that was a possibility because it was uh, not going below the seventh nerve. One could have approached it uh, subtemporally. <laughs> yes, Dr. Gupta, please. I have two comments. One is, uh, I think, uh, uh, of course, it's a individual surgeon's choice. I would have preferred subtemporal transtentorial approach because it gives a, 90, I mean, better view. Um, this first comment. Second, what Manas asked, if it's a um, partial excision, small residual, and patient is stable, I would go for a radio surgery. Well, for this patient, I'm talking about this patient. Right. So if there is still something uh, residual seen, 
uh, you but depends on the depends. I mean, you see, if the patient is becoming symptomatic because of mass effect, then you have no option but to operate. Correct. But if but it the, is the a problem... agent just seen on MRI and patient is stable, then you can think of radio surgery. Yeah, <laughs> the only question is reliability of uh, uh, post-operative MRI. I think uh, delayed MRI would probably be a little more uh, convincing. So I yeah. Yeah, either you do so, MRI in 24 to 48 hours, otherwise it's uh, not reliable. So I have two comments about this. So I think the problem of the inspection of the cavity and, and the uh, difficulty with essentially like not missing something that is sort of speak around the corner is really not dependent on whatever the angle of the approach is, right? There will always be a blind spot that you potentially can miss something. And I think the other thing about the MRI is I think there's a conceptual difference whether or not you treat that MRI as a, so to speak, yeah. intraoperative MRI where you're, you know, prepared to continue the surgery and go back versus the post-operative, I think, uh, you know, spot check where, as it was just pointed out several times, the threshold to coming back and, and taking that patient back immediately uh, without being forced to do so, which, you know, happened in this case because of the hemorrhage is really, really high, right? Your, your willingness to take a patient back that is otherwise doing well who just went through this uh, pretty massive surgery is going to be super high. Um, and, and I think, you know, in that sense, there's a difference between the intent of the intraoperative or postoperative MRI that is important to clarify before you do it, I suppose, right? Just, just to, you're, you're inherently on the same uh, page with yourself about what you want to do with that result. I agree absolutely uh, with that uh, policy and the observation. Okay. Can I just make a comment? Yes, Suresh. Yeah, let's say I, this is to SK Gupta. No, you told that if you see a residual lesion uh, at three month follow up, you will uh, give uh, uh, gamma knife treatment. So, can I ask what is the wipeout rate of Cavernova with gamma knife? This is not AVM where you can expect uh, the lesion may get uh, wiped out. Here, after you give gamma knife also. Lesion may remain dormant. As of now, after surgery, it is remaining dormant. So why do you want to give gamma knife if you are not sure whether this lesion can get wiped out with gamma knife? Yeah, more or less I agree with you. If the patient is asymptomatic, do nothing. But in this uh, patient was having symptoms. Okay. Right? okay. The rate of wipeout, nobody knows, SRS. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, the rate of wipeout <laughs> after SRS is still... The air, nobody knows, to be frank. I, I think in my slide, I mentioned the rate of decrease of size of cavernomas after radio surgery varies anywhere between 35 to 78 percent. Decrease in size after radio surgery. Uh, but, but Dwaraka, what I am asking, what are the chances it can get wiped out? So that's so, very, very that it, nobody can answer that question because it doesn't disappear. Very little, therefore, we. Uh, we have still not done a this is just radio a, surgery for a cavernoma. What is the uh, risk of bleed from a already gamma knife cavernoma, which has shrunk in size, but not more? So in my slides, I did mention that after gamma knife, the uh, I'll just I'll just tell you the this one. Uh, the first two year actual rate of bleed after gamma knife is between four to ten percent. And right. After two years, the rate of bleed decreases to one to three percent. Thanks, Varaya. That is what has actually kept us away. The early bleed rate, in fact, in Kondizolka's report, seems to show that uh, it increases. It is more than the natural history. Okay. The statistics after SRS is uh, too varied to be really relied upon because if you want to prove whatever you want to prove, you can use uh, that statistics. But if one thing is definite after two or three years after SRS, there is a definite evidence that there is a reduction in it. First two years, whether it is because of hemorrhage clustering or natural course, nobody really knows. But after two or three years, there is a definite evidence in literature available that yes, it is a little less. See, so the problem is when you are doing gamma knife for supratentorial and infratentorial, the principles are different. 
the problem is if you are doing gamma knife for cerebral cavernous of supratentorial one of the end points is prevention of seizures so probably then you will include the hemosiderin ring in the gamma knife plan in the brain stem cavernomas if you include the hemosiderin ring hemosiderin sometimes act as a radio sensitizer and the complication rates are high so the initial series by konzialka which was published in 2000 the rates of complications varied between 30 to 41% and also the dose of gamma knife as we have seen not only in cavernomas in many series the initial dose of uh, marginal dose was around 15 to 17 grays that has gradually come down and the latest series from taiwan uh, was around 11 to 12 grays so uh, the there has been a change in the pant, uh, pattern of how you are planning brain stem cavernomas that you are avoiding the hemosiderin ring and also you have decreased the dose of radiation to 12 grays while in a supratentorial it's different you include the hemosiderin ring so that is the reason why probably there has been a high rate of complication in the initial series but the fact remains that the first two year rate of bleed actually uh, biases you against gamma knife because there is a risk of bleed in the first two years uh, which does not uh, decrease significantly okay thank you dr dwaraka we have a second presentation by dr dev pujari so this is a, a young boy i think 14 years old who came with multiple cavernomas and the right frontal cavernoma had actually bled is from outstation and at this stage this was uh, operated upon at another center and this boy was asked uh, to see me for the cavernoma in the uh, pons here so what would be your uh, uh, advice at this stage this boy was asymptomatic for this and uh, this was just after uh, removal of this and this boy as you have seen has some other uh, small cavernomas supratentorial at this stage i asked him to uh, just uh, wait uh, and if he developed any symptoms he should see us and uh, he can repeat his mri uh, in the mean while at an interval of about a year uh, just as a uh, i mean really we don't know uh, but to see if there was any asymptomatic bleed would you agree with that i would that? agree with you i would agree with you I think it's perfect, sir. Because in 2002 there was no data to support gamma knife in cavernomas. Ah, uh, this is what he came back with uh, two years later. But this was at this stage he was asymptomatic again. This was a regular scan done as a follow up two years later, and uh, this was 2003 at that time. And as he was asymptomatic, I had asked him again to wait, though it looked ah. Uh, certainly that it had he had bled uh, in the mean while would you operate at this stage it is not presenting in a ependymal or pile surface anywhere and has no signs he has bled now no sorry he has rebled but asymptomatic yeah, i think surgery is not a good option i would say i mean at present i would have given the option of srx gamma uh, knife our uh, dr ben or dr shima i would you know if it, if it's rebled but but asymptomatic i i i'm pretty conservative i i you know i think i would watch this but you know i i like to you know you try to get as much rapport with the patient and you know and, and talk to the patient as much as possible so that they know that there is a good likelihood that it could potentially bleed. There's nothing worse than than saying, "Oh yeah, it's good. I'm going to watch." And then 2 days later it bleeds again, right? <laughs> so so I think um I, you know, as long as they understand that, you know, this may need to be operated on at some point, but at this point it's asymptomatic. There has been some activity. He's 16 and we'll follow it. He's 16 and the scan actually had done because he was just about to start his engineering studies. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, I agree. I it's hard to make him more intact, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. You know, I think uh it's uh, there there But seems to be no benefit for the patient later, right now. I'm sorry. As the luck would have it 6 months later he comes with a sixth nerve palsy and uh, uh attacks here. Yeah. And yeah. this is what the scan shows. 
So, so now you have a great excuse to figure out how to take him to surgery. I mean, I think the challenge is still there. It's not any easier, yeah. but I think once you have a deficit, yes. you know, at least conceptually, uh, that discussion is a little bit easier um, a lot of times. Um, oh, yes. But I agree with what Dr. Bain was saying earlier. I think the report, building that report is really uh, important with that patient. So what is the general policy about uh, uh, multiple cavernomas? I mean, they are supposed to be more benign, but uh, how, how do we observe them? How frequently do we scan them? Can I make a comment on this, uh, Dr. Shepujari? Yeah. Yes. You see, this patient, the third time, bled again. Yeah. And uh, this, this bleed could have been uh, fatal also, to be frank. So I would, if uh, one is, uh, you can always uh, back guess or retro uh, hindsight is always better. I would say that is the second time who came, so you, one could have offered reduced surgery at that time because you don't know how it, when the if it bleeds again that a patient may not land up a patient may land up with a deficit which is not That's acceptable. Right. Actually, this happened almost within a few months of his second uh, bleed. The third bleed occurred, and because of the clustering and because of the fact that he was symptomatic at this time, we went ahead and operated yeah. on him by a telomelar approach, and. Uh, he came out unscathed except for his six nerve palsy hadn't recovered uh, when he came for his uh, scan post-op about four or six months. And fortunately, he's had uh, some recovery from six nerve but hadn't completely recovered. Since then, he has recovered, he's completed his studies and uh, uh, we have managed well. But uh, in multiple cavernomas, I think how frequently you should... Uh, be scanning them and should you operate on them when they are asymptomatic remains a question. Uh, uh, can I ask a question, Vicky? If, uh, if this patient uh, had a solitary uh, lesion in the brain stem and uh, this patient and a patient with multiple lesions who already has one a cavernum which is bled, does the incidence of re bleed differ? Because in this, in the multiple one which has already bled, he has a higher chance of re bleed. So, uh, if in 2003, radio surgery was uh, available. Uh, it was available. Was... I, I was working in a place where we were doing radio surgery, but uh, at that time, the evidence was not in favor of radio surgery. But at uh, present, you would suggest radio surgery or, uh, or wait? Maybe now. at uh, this stage, I would uh, suggest we, we have now, I mean, this uh, boy was operated almost 15 years ago. But today, I would probably be more aggressive because we know that uh, brainstem cavernomas uh, uh, bleed rate is much higher than what we expected 15 years ago and uh, may even consider radio surgery today uh, if he was asymptomatic. Uh, one would have definitely given them as an option. Uh, I, I would still say that I would operate on him as soon as he became symptomatic. That would be the best option I would consider. I'm still not in favor of radio surgery and brainstem cavernomas, but I'm happy to listen to others' opinion. Sir, uh, there was another point which was made is that the vo volume of the cavernoma for gamma knife is a determinant of outcomes. Most of the so, studies with good outcomes, the volume, average volume of gamma knife has been a, of cavernomas in gamma knife has been 1.5 cc. And this certainly looks much, much No, no. More at, more. at the time he was operated, I think he deserved surgery. The question was earlier. No, I'm, I'm talking about the second time. So the third time was definitely uh, uh, surgery. The first time was definitely no surgery at uh, based on available evidence. The second time, which Professor Gupta said that gamma knife, the problem with gamma knife is the volume would have been much higher than 1.5 cc. And with the cystic component... Uh, it would be a little dangerous to in offer. In acutely bled cavernoma, again, it is difficult to measure the volume. That's another problem with uh, radio surgery. I was going to ask no, you, I have probably not treated any cavernoma uh, with uh, gamma knife yet. The volume is easy to measure. The problem is the volume is much more in this. Uh, gamma knife is not a front uh, first line option in any case of cavernous angioma. It's, it's uh, why I would have offered gamma knife, I said, because at the point, second time when he presented, surgery was not a good option. Correct. 
and in want for and observation you cannot predict in brain stem because the risk of uh, hem second hemorrhage can be very devastating so for want of doing anything there is no harm in offering gamma knife that's what at present at least we don't know yes. what the result may be uh, we, we cannot predict either observation or gamma knife but if at present patient has bled and it's surgically you think it's not possible i think gamma knife is a sort of a midway option Thank you, Dr. Gupta. I request Dr. Siddharth Ghosh to present uh, 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 two cases on uh, in cavern normal. Dr. Ghosh, Siddharth Ghosh. Thank you, Vernes. Uh, I I will just present a couple of cases of uh, uprotentorial cavern normal, as uh, Dr. Gupta has uh, mentioned, and uh, just a continuation of that. You see this, uh, the first patient, this is a medial temporal lobe, right-sided uh, lesion, as is typical, looks like a cavernoma. This boy, 22-year-old young man, who presented with refractory seizures. He had, uh, he was on two anticonvulsants, but he was uh, having seizures almost like uh, twice a month. And he was added on a third con anticonvulsants uh, elsewhere, even though the seizure was not under control. So this is one case whether we should uh, increase the anticonvulsants and because he has not bled, uh, uh, he has small hemorrhages but no major bleed, whether we should uh, just still manage him conservatively or we give him radio surgery or we operate it as a because it's a medial temporal lobe and quite accessible and though he has not had a major bleed as a part of the epilepsy surgery, we should uh, operate him. The second case is an elderly gentleman, 55-year-old gentleman, who presented with uh, acute vertigo. And uh, it, was, it was thought that he's probably having a stroke and since the MRI images was done and shown that he has got a uh, basal ganglia uh, cavernoma. So uh, this is the patient uh, uh, who had a recent episode. It just came about uh, one month ago. Uh, so this is one case whether we should observe or whether we should consider radio surgery for. Obviously, this is not a case for surgery uh, because it's in the left side eloquent area. So uh, uh, I, would, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Gupta about what you'd like to do for these two cases. First case, I think uh, I would say there is only one option, surgery. Because of the relatively accessible location, intractable epilepsy, and the area is caesarogenic. I mean, medial temporal lobe is a area. So I think there is no, there's no second choice. I think patient would benefit by surgery. Uh, there is no, I think there is no other option. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Gupta rightly said, and I'm sure everybody will agree that this is a case of surgery and so he was operated and it's about a year now and he's seizure free and he is now off anticonvulsants and we did the during surgery we used the depth electrode and we found that even the there was epileptic focus in the uh, in the adjacent middle temporal gyrus also so we did a neocortisectomy and then uh, he is doing very well without any seizures so what about the second case, uh, Dr. Gupta? Is uh, presented with a bleed? Or, uh, yeah, he presented with a small bleed, as you can so see. So again, uh, may, there's a choice between observation and stereotactic radius SRS. Since the patient has presented with a bleed, and uh, if he bleeds again, this is a location where it can cause significant deficits if he bleeds again. So uh, after the first bleed, the chances of re-bleed are around 4.5%. So you can uh, observe also, but to be more proactive, uh, you can, I mean, SRS is not a bad option in this case. So uh, can, I just, can I just tell it? I think that second case is uh, incidentally detected in left chordate cavernoma uh, while getting scanned for acute vertigo. Uh, to me, it looks like that only. That is, it is not a cause for that vertigo anyway. You that, can... that part is... Uh... I can't answer that thing. If it's incidental, you don't do anything, but... No, this is, while investigating for acute vertigo, people found a 
a coordinated uh, cavernoma. That is my reading, because this cannot produce acute vertigo. Yeah, I also thought so that it's just like an incidental finding, and uh, this may not be the cause for his acute vertigo. So I also thought that we should observe him instead of straight away upfront uh, radio surgery. So any anybody else have got any other opinion? Yeah, Dr. Skimmer or Dr. Bain, Dr. Jankovic, any comments on this? What do you do with the second case? In my practice, I would probably observe this. Uh, you know, I, I think the thing we have to remember is, you know, we, we think that gamma knife, um, and, you know, a lot is not known, uh, but we think that gamma knife, oh, you know, it's something you can do to be proactive about the lesion, but there, there's risk to gamma knife as well. And so I think for this, that I, it sounds to me is incidental um, and not a massive hemorrhage, you know, which cavernous malformations don't usually do. I think I would just watch this and conservatively manage this. I would, I would in general terms agree, um, although, you know, I think uh, gamma knife is a reasonable option. I'm not that concerned about the, I guess, downsides of that. Uh, but I do think that it, again, comes down to having a really dis a good discussion with that patient, potentially over multiple sessions to really understand what the, what the upsides and downsides of proactively, so to speak, radiating a lesion like this uh, might entail. Um, you know, I think that that part of the decision-making process uh, is really important uh, because, you know, you're not uh, conveying any tangible benefit to that patient um, in terms of improving uh, their quality of life or anything right now. Um, but uh, if, if they are really, for example, super anxious about this, um, you know, it does, does help to like discuss this over several sessions and really come to the same, uh, uh, on the same page on that. Uh, Dr. Clements, uh, do you have uh, nowadays, it's you know, the high field uh, you know, MRI available where we can pick up uh, more number of uh, like uh, cavernomas because is there anything that, you know, is there, if we have heard that about is there, uh, something like a 14 Tesla MRI, they can pick up much more number of this incidental cavernomas. Do you have any experience in your institute or uh, Professor Baines, uh, like to pick up rate of these cavernomas, incidental cavernomas are more with uh, more sophisticated MRI technique other than GRE sequence. So I'll, I'll perhaps uh, leave it at that. You know, we in general terms have access to three Tesla MRIs um, as the sort of like highest uh, field strength on the clinical basis. You know, there are some institutions that have research magnets. Uh, but those are not necessarily used on a routine basis. And while it is true that you potentially see more lesions um, and, and see the anatomy of the lesion better on uh, T2-weighted or, or Fiesta-type uh, sequences, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, enhance or improve the decision-making process because you basically are faced with more problems, right? And, and you have to come up with something that is good for that patient um, at the same way and, and distilling this down to the principles of like, what is actually symptomatic and, and what is of benefit uh, to the patient and, and what you can you know, offer as a therapeutic option. I think that remains. Uh, I'm not, I, I have not been so like impressed with the ability of, I think, uh, like having higher field strength magnets um, that help me with that, I guess. But I, I, I would love to hear what Mark has to say about that. Yeah, we, we have a research grade seven Tesla MRI. That's that one picture I showed in my slides of that AVM. Um, you ha it's all research though. So we're not scanning, routinely scanning patients on that. Um, what we have seen though, uh, we've really focused our efforts on AVMs and we've um, uh, imaged uh, a fair amount, probably about 10 AVMs now. And we have seen uh, a couple of instances where we see a susceptibility weighted image, um, uh, you know, hemorrhage in that AVM that we didn't see on the three Tesla. And, you know, it, we have to extrapolate the data, right? Because Lawton has that data where if there's some GRE sequence in an AVM, maybe it's a higher risk AVM. We don't, I don't know if, if the seven Tesla. So that, that needs to be worked out. Um, I have not seen a cavernous malformation yet on that seven Tesla. That's a good project. Um, you know, maybe in these patients that have a single 
asymptomatic cavernous malformations, we could send some of them to scan and see if we find other ones that we didn't see on three Tesla. That'd be interesting. The SWS image, probably even on a three Tesla MRI, seems to show many more in multiple cavernomas. Or, uh, in fact, uh, there's a good paper on uh, post uh, radiotherapy patients in uh, medulloblastoma children, where they have shown so many. Uh, radiation-induced cavernomas uh, in in uh, in a large number of patients uh, on SWI images, even on a three Tesla machine. So I think it's probably the sequence rather than just the field strength of the magnet. I think that's a good point, though, and and we sort of like uh, touched on this almost uh, a little while ago. You know, I mean, to me, those behave differently than um, you know patients with a, I guess, single or or two cavernomas or so. For some reason, having this almost like cavernomatosis, uh, where they're all over the place, um, that that seems to be uh, having a much more benign co uh, course um, a lot of times. Thank you. I would just uh, show an, another interesting case. Uh, this is as state we operated this case and then patient is fine. We had to do a uh, neocorticectomy and uh, patient is doing fine. Uh, I would just say one more case. This is a young boy, 14 year old boy who suddenly presented with an acute onset of uh, hemorrhage and uh, he, he was, suddenly became hemiplegic and aphasic. He came to us, and though his uh, he, his GCS was quite okay, 15 by 15, but he had this uh, large bleed, and uh, so he was uh, taken up. Obviously, there is no confusion that this patient should require surgery, and because this is a large bleed supratentorial, which uh, we normally don't see that large bleed for a supratentorial uh, cavernoma. So he was operated uh, on a semi-emergency basis on the next stage cell. And uh, this is about six months follow-up. He's doing well. His hemiparesis has improved. His cognitive functions has improved. He started writing with his left hand, but his speech is normal. He still walks with a hemiparity gait. So uh, this is one. Any, any comment on this, please? What approach did you take, Siddharth? Because Dr. Bain right. showed us a very good uh, uh, case with a, yeah. a low frontal approach. I am just uh, curious. Yeah, I went you. like an insular approach, the transylvian insular approach, and I could uh, get into by the temporal you know, operculum and got into the hematoma and took it out and the cavernoma. So I think this is a great case for a tubular case. I, I would do a, not not super low because you have some of those <laughs> drives in the front. I might go a little higher and come top down, um, but it would be it, that would be a really good case because again you have that hemorrhage there and you could remove the hemorrhage, look around the cavity, um, and you know the, the way you wand the port, you can look around the cavity very nicely and see the cavernous malformation and remove it. So that, that's what I would do on this now. Would you would you consider doing a DTI in these patients to see show that what what would be a good uh, place to put your uh, yeah. uh, brain path uh, uh, through? I would, yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I also agree that DTI would be definitely because especially on the left side, and uh, the DTI definitely is useful for this case. So. Yep, good case. Um. So if you have Dr. Siddharth, you have, this is the last case or you have more cases? No, no this is the last case. Thank you. Okay. I have one brain stem um, uh, cavernoma, but it's already been discussed. So I yeah. Okay. yeah, but we are also late. It's now, we are uh, 35 minutes more than uh, the scheduled time. Uh, but, uh, but we have this audience still there because the uh, discussion was very good. And uh, the cases actually uh, tested the speakers also. What you have learned from the... Uh, the presentation it's an application of the cases what was presented uh, i'd like to thank uh, my co-moderator dr clemens to uh, to to be there in all the three sessions i'm requesting that he should be there in the next session also uh, i'd like to thank our speakers dr bain dr suresh nair dr dwaraknath srinivas and dr gupta uh, for teaching us uh, the way to manage cavernoma uh, and hemangioblastoma and uh, I, uh, 
to thank the panelists, Dr. Dev Pujari, Dr. Jankovic, and Dr. Ghosh uh, for presenting beautiful cases, which uh, we had a very good interaction, uh, with good interaction from the audience and good attention from the audience. Uh, with these few words, I'd like to thank all the audience for being there till late in the night and uh, uh, expect you people to be there next month on December 9th on vascular mouth uh, lesions of the spinal vertebral column and spinal cord. Uh, a concluding remark from Dr. Clemens and we'll see you tonight. Dr. Clemens, please tell a concluding remark. Yeah, thank you. I think this was another example of, you know, our great collaboration. Um, and I, I'd love to come back in the fourth one. I, I would uh, encourage everyone to just, you know, come back, bring your friends, make this like, you know, a great session. Uh, again, I think we uh, often, uh, we, we don't very often discuss spinal cord AVMs and, and lesions uh, of vascular nature in the spinal uh, column. Uh, so I think that should be really interesting. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Before we conclude, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Jagru from Intas for uh, sponsoring and uh, looking after the logistics. Um, thank you and good night and good morning to all. Good morning to all in the US. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah. you, Manas. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.